looking for a light, right? <laughs> well, we got that or, or <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the April 6th. Yeah. 6th. <laughs> uh, for all 2016 uh, meeting of the town uh, council and this is a workshop on uh, uh, storm stormwater permitting and I will ask uh, Dan Bacon to Dan, are you going to or Angela? Angela is taking the lead tonight. The town engineer and Angela and will lead us off. Great. Um, yeah, I am Angela Blanchett, the town engineer, and tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our state stormwater permits the town of Scarborough has. Um, Steve Buckley from Public <coughs> Works is also going to jump in in a couple of places where he has more hands-on day-to-day with a couple of the aspects um, of the permit. So um, just to start also, Mike Shaw from Public Works and Dan Bacon, um, obviously our bosses, <laughs> that oversee what we do on a daily basis with um, as far as the permit goes. So um, I'm going to start off though just by saying that we do have a state stormwater permit and um, Part of um, the permit is to reach out to council on an annual basis, so that's why I'm here. And I'm going to walk through as quickly as possible um, some of the key components of it. As all staff here can tell you that I love to talk about stormwater, so I'm going to try to keep <laughs> it as short as possible. It's my passion, and I'll, any questions you have after, I would be happy to talk with you guys individually. Um, so it starts with the Clean Water Act, and that's um, the federal requirement, which actually states that as a regulated community, we must have a permit to actually discharge our runoff and our stormwater into um, waters of the U.S. government, which is any stream, any brook, um, the marsh, wetlands, all of those are included in that. So. Um, there's many names that we call our state stormwater permit. Um, you'll hear MS4, you'll hear NEPDES. I'm going to talk through <coughs> the rest of this presentation and calling it our state stormwater permit, but you'll hear many other things come up. It's just kind of keeping it basic. Um, as I said, we're a regulated community and there are 30 in the state of Maine. Um, and you'll see from this, this is the map of all the municipalities. And the blue are the regulated what they're calling MS4 communities. Um, and obviously, they're clustered in the urbanized areas. You can see the Bangor cluster, Lewiston, Auburn, the greater Portland, and down at Kittery and Wells area. Um, and so those are really in the, the areas where the most dense population, the dense growth, um, and that's where the DEP steps in and has some oversight over what we do um, as far as stormwater goes. Um, Maine's a little different in a lot of, or most of, I would say, the New England state. EPA regulates directly with those municipalities. The state of Maine steps in and, and administers it for them. So we report directly to, to DEP on many of the things we do. They have EPA looking over their shoulder, though, and audit them periodically as well. So some of the things that, um, <coughs> as a regula regulated community, um, we are looking at improving and protecting our watersheds, specifically our urban impaired streams. And I don't know if you've heard that term before, but the town of Scarborough has two of them. It's uh, Red Brook and Phillips Brook. And so currently, um, <coughs> we are implementing a watershed management plan in Red Brook. So you'll see a lot of activity. We recently pulled out a culvert that was on the newspaper about that, improving um, the passage for fish, fish passage and aquatic life. Um, there will be more projects coming, you'll see, um, along that corridor, the Red Brook watershed. And then you'll also hear about Phillips Brook, which we just got uh, awarded an EPA grant for a watershed management plan. So we're going to start to ramp that up and reach out to stakeholders and start formulating what are the steps that need to help um, improve Phillips Brook. And then Scarborough is being uh, proactive and we're looking ahead at not only improving but protecting our watersheds. So we're looking at Millbrook as our next step, which is not impaired at the moment, but is, has risk to be. And so um, we're actually <coughs> looking at putting in for that grant application, which is be a first. It would look at uh, Scarborough as being a leader in how we protect our waters, which I think um, 
would actually show moving forward other communities looking at how Scarborough deals with this and moving behind us with their own watersheds. And so it might be helpful just to describe where Redbrook, Phillipsbrook, and yeah. Millbrook are, just so yeah. people have an orientation. So Redbrook starts up at um, Route 22, the headwaters, and it actually runs pretty much parallel with 114. Right in my backyard. <laughs> right in her backyard. <laughs> and then it comes out and it actually crosses at the intersection of Payne Road and Cummings. So you don't really see it, so it goes through more of our, our built up commercial area and enters into um, South Portland. So um, it's really about um, cleaning up maybe some of the areas that are heavily developed on the lower ends and protecting the headwaters above from um, and making sure the development is done correctly to, to protect that those waters. Yeah. So uh, what what constitutes you know why Redbrook and Millbrook and not like the Nunsuch let's say or yeah. something like that? That's a great question. Um, DEP and EPA both do testing in and streams throughout Maine. Um, and they have found some testing results that show that um, it does not meet uh, classification. So there's certain criteria and things, thresholds they have to meet. So it's not meeting the requirements that they, they want to see. Okay. Um, so what we do is we have a municipal permit, which is on a five-year cycle. So every five years, starting from 2003, the town of Scarborough has um, entered into this permit with um, DEP and EPA and every five years a new permit comes along and those requirements get ramped up. So they want to see progress, they want to see that you're, you're meeting the requirements and then we're going to the next step in the next five years. So our next permit will come up in 2018 and so I'll talk about at the end a little bit about we're, what we're projecting for the next steps. And, and how Scarborough needs to stay kind of a little ahead of that and predicting what's coming so that we, we know and can plan ahead for that. Um, and can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. You might answer this, so I apologize <laughs> if I'm speaking out of turn, but um, because it's Redbrook, right, that connects with South oh. Portland? Yes, yeah, South Portland, yes. Um, how does that kind of work? Do we partner with them on any of these types mm -hmm. of we do, okay. Yes, great question. Um, Mike is working on a project right now on um, Cummings Road, because Cummings Road is right. partially in Scarborough yep. and um, South Portland, and they're doing some stormwater treatment measures along that, and so we're in partnership with that as one particular project, but we, we do that with a host of other <coughs> aspects, too. And I guess I, I failed to mention, sorry, Tom, uh, we talked about Phillips Brook is actually over in the Dunstan area. It's near the South Portland, I mean the Saco line mm -hmm. um, along Route 1. It crosses Broad Turn Road. And the last one, Millbrook, um, is in the area, um, I think behind the new sawgrass, it comes out and has, heads to the marsh. It actually crosses Route 1 yeah. near along the Sawyer Road, Between yeah. Sawyer Road and Scarborough Downs. Yeah. This is probably not really an engineer part of it, but do you find when you have to partner with them that they take it, I mean, when you came up, you were very clearly passionate about this. Do you find like when you partner with them that those communities are just as passionate about it and, and are helpful and the process? Because I can imagine yeah. the process is pretty <laughs> extensive. <laughs> yeah, I think what helps is, is actually what I'm going to get into next is uh, we have an interlocal stormwater working group. Okay. So we meet monthly with 14 communities and they, they range from Biddeford all the way to Freeport and out to Wyndham. So on a monthly basis, there's 14 communities that all come together and we talk about just this. We talk about our permit and our stormwater permit and what we're doing around that permit, um, obstacles that have come up, how we're solving them, and so we're working collaboratively rather than parallel. Right. Yeah, and good. so when things come up, we're, yeah, it's, it's very helpful. That's so are we, oh sorry, are we no. permitted as a group or are we permitted individually as a municipality? Individually. Okay. So the town of Scarborough, yes, we have okay. a permit. Even when we work on joint projects, each town has to have their own. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we report annually mm -hmm. on our own okay. as well. Okay. And then we get um, comments back on, on our uh, report. Okay. So I'm going to go through as quickly as possible. Um, these are the six minimum thresholds. There's certain things that we report on, and um, I'm going to go through. There's a couple, as I mentioned, that Stephen works more closely with, so he's going to come up and talk about, but I'm going to start right in on um, our first requirement has to do 
with um, public education and outreach. And part of that is what I'm doing tonight. It is um, reaching out to council. Um, I've had planning board walk workshops as well. Um, those type of things to get knowledge out on what we are doing and what the permit requirements are. Um, some other aspects is um, Scarborough Adult Education has a great program that does a lot um, with yardscaping, which um, so our interlocal stormwater group we call IZIWIG. Um, you can see actually the, the symbol is, is 14 raindrops all in a ray. And um, they come in and they do a lot of actual education in Scarborough, which is um, helpful in satisfying our permit. The other thing is um, on a biannual basis, um, we hold a, storm, a main stormwater conference. Um, which is collaborative effort for the 14 communities. And I was lucky enough to convince Tom to be on a panel at the last, that was last November, and talking about all the great things Scarborough is doing for stormwater. Her passion rubbed off on me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can say no. <laughs> um, so the other thing that we do collaboratively with the 14 communities is um, public participation, which um, this will be the fifth year we're doing the urban runoff 5K. Um, all the money that's raised from this um, goes to clean water education in the classroom. So members from the, from the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District are able to go into the classrooms. Um, also, they're able to provide materials for teachers so they can continue on their own. Um, it's, a, it's a great, great program. And I have to point out that's my daughter crossing the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> um, and every year they do a largest municipal team award. So I'm always trying to get everybody signed up. Um, I'm looking towards Scarborough winning it this year. I haven't seen Tom signed up yet, though. But this is another thing I report to DEP on is how many staff are, are um, on the team how many Scarborough residents are there because I need to get the word out. We have posters all around town um, encouraging residents to participate. Um, and also how many we have volunteers. Public Works has been great. Huge numbers every year coming from Public Works um, and, and Mike's staff that are all along the race course um, handing out water and directing. So it's great. Um, the next one is going to be Steven. Okay, so uh, I'm Stephen Buckley. Um, I work down at Public Works uh, with Mike Shaw. Um, the project and data coordinator down there. Um, so I do GIS and asset management system for Public Works. Um, and I also do um, the MCM3 and 6, which we'll talk about later on for the stormwater. So MCM3 is the illicit discharge detection and elimination uh, portion of the permit. So what essentially this is identifying um, and stopping any forms of illicit discharge um, that may get into the town's infrastructure um, and then discharge into waters of the United States. Um, so illicit discharge is covered under the town's non stormer water um, discharge ordinance, which was adopted in 2007. Um, and this covers several things that are allowed um, that aren't non stormwater. Anything else that's not on that list is considered an illicit discharge. Um, there are five main categories within the MCM um, three. The first one is mapping, uh, so we're required to maintain uh, maps of all of our stormwater infrastructure. Um, so that's 141 miles of ditches, culverts, and pipes, uh, about two and a half thousand structures, which includes catch basins, manholes, uh, etc. And then we're also required to uh, keep track of things like detention ponds. Infiltration basin, etc. Does that include private as well, or only municipal? Um, we are currently only required to track uh, municipal, but we have started tracking private as a lot of those feed mm -hmm. directly into into ours. So it's useful to know where those connections are. Just as a quick uh, segue to the budget discussion tonight, you'll see in the five-year capital plan there's a fairly aggressive mm -hmm. project to do. Uh, Television work essentially for all that underground infrastructure, so we can 
further enhance our capability to understand what we have and what condition it's in. Uh, it's, it's a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we currently um, have mainly uh, municipal infrastructure, but we have started uh, mapping the private infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure is mapped by watershed, so we know um, which watershed uh, pipes and things discharge into, so if there is an issue, we can track that through the maps um, to look for likely sources. Um, the next Part of MCM3 is outfall inspections. These are dry weather inspections, uh, which are defined as uh, any period of 72 hours or more where there's been no rainfall. Um, the reason why they're dry weather inspections is so that if there's any flow after that 72 hour period, then uh, that's a good sign that there's a discharge could be occurring. Um, in Scarborough, that's a little bit more difficult for a lot of wetlands, so a lot of the outfalls do typically flow continuously. Um, so the prior weather ins inspections consist of visual inspection. Uh, we go around, we're required to um, inspect 20% of our 220 uh, outfalls each year. Um, so we go to the outfall, uh, it's visual inspection, we're looking for, as uh, I said, dry weather flow, uh, things like bad odors, um, trash, any sediments or anything that's um, I buy the outfall, um, and it's also an opportunity to look to see if any maintenance needs to um, occur at the outfall or um, connected infrastructure. Um, the next part of MCM3 is ditch inspections, um, which is related to the outfall inspections. Um, we do this as part of our uh, routine maintenance uh, within the uh, works. Um, so this is ensuring that ditches, um, the one that was not any of those discharges to them, uh, there's no trash build up there functioning, um, and that there's nothing getting into the water bodies. Um, the next one, which is new for this permit cycle, was um, mapping and determining which septic systems within our priority watersheds, so Red Brook and Phillips Brook, um, so we were required to map those that were older than 20 years um, that had the potential of, if they failed, discharging into Redbrook and Phillips Brook. Um, we're now in the third year of that, so we have all of those maps, and we're now in the process of doing drive-by inspections, um, looking for any signs that there could be uh, any of those that failed. Um, Redbrook and Phillips Brook aren't in bed for bacteria, so it's probably unlikely that there is an issue with those, but um, that's part of the permit this year. Um, and the final part of MCM3 is um, hydrant flushing. So the, the DEP has asked the municipalities and the uh, water use energy companies to uh, determine whether or not hydro flushing activities, um, which are highly correlated, are having effect on um, the chlorine concentration within, within the water bodies. Um, so far, they've determined that there is a chance um, of there being uh, elevated chlorination levels. Um, so Port Water District and Main Water, which are the two utilities can be uh, operated to Gabra, uh, they started the use of a diffuser, um, which uh, <coughs> takes the chlorinated water and removes the chlorine from it to acceptable levels uh, before it's then discharged, <coughs> typically in front of the road wire or the ditch. Um, and that's what I'm for form by. Um, <laughs> Get the yanks, so. Yep, I mean, yeah, I know. So um, I'm back to, you see in the corner, uh, back to planning and code, uh, where we deal with construction site runoff control, which is basically once, once it leaves the planning board, what are we doing? Um, we, we're meeting with contractors for pre-construction meetings. We're telling them what we expect. And basically, I tell the contractor, you keep your dirt on your site. That's pretty much the rule. So as long as that's happening, we're good. And it's so it's about us um, controlling some oversight and inspection out there. So um, because once the soil leaves their site, it's an actual violation for the town of Scarborough's permit. So DEP can come back to the town and say we have violated the permit. Um, the next thing is uh, post, it's basically post construction. So after they're done, um, many of the large sites around town have to annually report 
to the Planning and Code Office and saying we've maintained our stormwater ponds or filter areas, any, any BMPs they're doing on site, and we have to track those and report back to DEP saying, yep, everyone is, is maintaining them, they're in good order, and they're working as they were designed and has the Planning Board approved them. On that construction piece, does the yes. town have to report it so when it does any type of expansion or new building? Do we report like any other business developer? Do we report, you mean so to like some building we, expansion? Yeah, so like when we did the expansion to the high school and they built that retention pond that's in yes. the park, we have to go through the same process Correct. as any other business. When Correct. We do okay. Yes. So the final part of the permit is MCM6. Um, this covers good housing, good housekeeping and policing prevention. Um, for municipal operations. Um, so this is ensuring that one of the operations that the town does um, is contribution to illicit discharge um, from our sites um, or when we're out and around in the town. Um, so the first part is keeping an inventory of all um, town facilities and operations that occur within those within those facilities. Um, so for example, on the left we've got a picture of Fuel Island, um, just down at the school department. Um, so we're required to keep track of those and, and what activities occur at those and potential sources of pollution uh, from those sites. Um, the next part is maintaining operation and maintenance plans for the various um, facilities around Scarborough. So um, Public Works has their own operation and maintenance which covers um, what to do with spills, how to clean those up, um, possible sources of pollution, truck washing, um, and then for community services and fire department, they also have one. So for the fire department, it covers um, how to report spills that occur up, um, as a result of traffic accidents or any incident they um, respond to. They're required to keep track of those. Um, the public works facility uh, stores large amounts of oil um, and other petroleum products. Um, so we have um, SWIP and SPCC plans for those, um, which are Basically, plans that cover what we do if, if any of those would fail, um, what measures we have in, in place to um, ensure that uh, we can clean them up properly, um, reporting them to the DEP, um, and getting them on site if, if need be. Um, the next part is staff training. Um, so, we do annual training um, to all the facilities that have an own plan. So, we do it for um, the public works staff service staff and the fire department, police department do their own training within house. Um, and that just goes over what, what to look for, so what is illicit discharge, uh, what they need to do to report it, who they need to report it to. The next part is street sweeping. So we're required to uh, sweep all town roads um, at least once a year, um, as soon as possible after last snow melt. So that typically runs from March to the end of May, uh, sometimes into June, depending on, on the winter. Um, the next part of, of MTM6 is catch basin cleaning. Um, so we split the town um, in half. We do half the catch basins one year and the other half um, the next year. And the priority areas like Route 1 and um, 114 areas like that. Um, get done every year to the amount of traffic that we have on those. Um, sorry, what's the catch basin? Um, so a catch basin is basically those grates that are on the road. Um, if they, any water that's um, running along the road goes into their system. Um, and they have, they have a sump at the bottom which catches any sediment or anything or trash from We suck those out. Um, and the final part of MCM6 is maintaining our infrastructure and having a plan for maintaining our infrastructure. Um, so that's um, repairing the ditches, repairing the catch basins. Uh, <coughs> as Tom mentioned, um, part of that is uh, identifying um, uh, and coming up with a plan of how we're going to maintain those. So that's why we're looking to have our, all our uh, pipes cameras um, so we can start to put together a plan. Well, 
Um, I'm going to try to breeze through these next ones really quick. <laughs> because um, basically it takes a lot of time and effort for staff to report all this. If it's not written down, if it's not reported, it didn't happen. So that takes um, time and effort. And also <coughs> it's not just Steve and I working on it. It is all of the departments um, collaborate on this. We, um, we, we meet, we collect information. It's all reported. Um, <coughs> through us, but it is uh, definitely a collaboration between all the departments. And then um, we're actually looking ahead um, at what's coming. And I think um, staff is looking at um, as Scarborough as, as a leader and looking at how residents want to protect our natural resources. So we want to look at what's coming, but be, be ahead of that and know what, we're, what we need to plan for. And so we looked at, um, obviously going down through this, we're working with the sanitary district and, and where their infrastructure is, so we're looking at the septic systems. Um, education for both business, commercial, and developers and contractors. Um, I've, been, I've talked with Karen Martin, Fedco, um, looking at how we're moving, that, can move that ahead. Um, we are looking towards greater oversight on other parcel, uh, parcels like the industrial facilities and monitoring it, our outfalls, which currently right now we do inspections, but we don't do sampling. That would be a huge mm -hmm. jump. And that's what we're seeing in other New England states as part of their permit requirement, which is coming our way. So we're looking at um, monitoring equipment. How do you need to deal with that as far as staff and, and time? Um, just looking so we can plan ahead for that. Um, there's also a lot more tracking coming, the, the pollution, um, the pollutants coming from the outfalls as, as Stephen went through. Um, we're looking at one of the things that other New England states have to do now is start tracking our impervious area. That's the paved mm. surfaces, the rooftops. Um, and doing it as a watershed basis. And so we're also looking, you'll see in the budget, for um, high resolution aerial um, mapping, which will help with that piece of it. And then obviously knowing what our infrastructure is, as Stephen has said, um, about doing the subsurface drainage assessment, I think is, is another key thing. So that's, that's what I have. Um, I think you'll hear more, uh, hopefully, Hopefully I'll be able to talk to you again <laughs> about some other things that we're doing because we have a lot of <coughs> great initiatives coming up. Um, we're going to be looking at our stormwater ordinance itself and looking at stormwater capacity, which means uh, maybe doing in-house permitting instead of going out for DEP for, for new development. It gives us more local control and knowing what's important for Scarborough and how we can tweak um, where the stormwater system is, how it's designed to, to better suit the town rather than having two parallel systems we're going through DEP and going through our local planning board. And um, other initiatives about putting in, as I mentioned, um, future applications for EPA grant money for some of these stormwater initiatives. So I'm going to end it with that. Thank you. Good questions. Chris, uh, two quick ones. Um, you mentioned monitoring. Um, what's the cutoff for self-monitoring, like if an industry has regular discharge at a manufacturing facility or something. So when you're talking about um, a facility like that, it, they have to have their own industrial permit. Mm -hmm. So they are regulated directly through the state from DEP. So they have their own thresholds and monitoring systems and um, criteria, I guess, in place. And the last question I'd have is, are, do we have any challenges with meeting our permitting? It sounds like we're pretty much on top of things, but... Uh, um, we did have an audit um, last year at this time. I, I was not on staff then, um, so I can't speak a whole lot to it, but um, there was definitely some room for improvement, and that's where I'm trying to, I guess, build from that. Um, like I said, at any time, DEP or EPA can come in and do open the books, and that's where it goes back to documentation and see what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, so it also comes back on an annual basis from our reporting. We get feedback as well. So there's always there's always improvement happening. Is the audit annual or is it uh, uh, discretionary on the part of DEP? It's discretionary. However, there hadn't been audits, I, I would say, I think ever. And so EPA stepped in and said DEP needs to start doing them. So by the end of 2018, all of our 
our MS, all the regulated communities in Maine will have had an audit of some sort. Um, right now, they're focusing on, I think, the greater Portland area. Um, I think there's been a couple in the Bangor area and one in the Lewiston Auburn area, but it's, it's, it's coming for everybody. It's, Scarborough was, I would say, the first. So they were the guinea pig, and everyone's learning from that. And that's where it goes back to working collaboratively. Stephen's been a great help in our Izzy Rig uh, meetings showing what we're doing for outfalls and helping other communities, and we're getting the same back from others on other aspects we need to improve on. Did that audit trigger a follow-up audit requirement, or was <coughs> it a, a report was issued and you, you just need to correct what's in the report? I'll let Mike maybe speak to that. Well, interestingly enough, our report, our, our audit was from EPA Region 1, so the folks from Boston came up. Um, and to date, we, we received some feedback uh, from right when they were doing the audit. Uh, we addressed those concerns that they had. Um, and although it was December 5th of 2014 that we received that audit, we received no further official documentation from the EPA. Perfect. Doesn't mean that we're not going <laughs> to. <you know, laughs> if it were it possible, we haven't heard. gotten around to it yet. Yeah. I was told it could be six months yeah. to 18 months before we hear from them. So okay. stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. This is a uh, this is a federal requirement, federal permit. Correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it unfunded or is it funded? The work that has to be done by the. It community? is. It is an unfunded mandate. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> good. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we'll adjourn momentarily and commence uh, in two minutes. Yeah.
please. Councilor Babine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Catalina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Cazzo? Here. Mr. Chairman Donovan? Present. Uh, as we customarily do, uh, general public comment on any matter that is not on the agenda otherwise, please uh, appear at the podium and identify yourself and your address. Thank you. My name is Mike Doyle. I own FalmaToday.me. I've done about 80-something articles about Scarborough and primarily the police department. Tonight I'm going to give you a report on the recent court activity. In the hearing in December, Mr. Hall disclosed that out of the 1,372 emails that I was given a chance to inspect, there was some place between 100 and 1,000 that had not been provided. Uh, I moved for an in-camera review by the judge that is still uh, in process. Apparently, there was 1,169 emails not provided nor notified legally why they weren't provided. Waiting for the... Uh, for the judge to rule on that. In the federal court, where the town is being sued for violating my First Amendment rights to free speech at this podium, the R&R, which is the uh, report and recommendation by the magistrate, uh, stated that he thought that the council, other than Mr. Hall, uh, the chair lady at the time, and I think Ms. Holbrook <coughs> of St. Clair, those three people are still in the federal suit along with the town of Scarborough. I objected to that and want to include the entire town council that were present during that uh, situation, which essentially was uh, accessories before and after the fact and took no action to intervene. So that's where we are right now, and I'm sure Thompson Bowie and Mr. Franco are building the town for thousands of dollars to defend the town. And at some point, I will file a freedom of access to find out how much was spent to defend this kind of behavior. Thank you. Anyone else would like to uh, speak in the public time? Seeing none. Close the general public comments. Uh, minutes of March 16, 2016, regular meeting. <coughs> Motion, please. So moved. Second. Uh, comments or corrections? Uh, I'll abstain. I was absent. Thank you. Absent. Thank you. Councilor St. Clair. Uh, any other comments or corrections? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, adjustments to the agenda. Uh, not at this time. Uh, items to be signed are treasurer's warrants, which I will sign later. Uh, order number 16-20, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the request for a second-hand dealer application from Andre and Irina Meliev, DBA LNL Jewelers, located at 426 <coughs> U.S. Route 1, Suite 3. Uh, the town clerk has uh, indicated to us that there are no issues uh, associated with this permitting. Uh, and I think we would have public comment at this time. Anyone in the public who would like to comment about this? <coughs> Seeing none, accept uh, uh, the motion. Move approval. Second. Comment. Uh, anyone wish to comment on this? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. <clears throat> Order number 16-21, a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal request for a liquor license from Stanley Bailey, DBA Bailey Seafood Restaurant, located at 165 Pine Point Road. Uh, we have a report which I think the town manager will <coughs> summarize for I'll us. Reduce, and Dan Bacon is here to perhaps provide some more detail. Um, dating back uh, as late as, excuse me, as early as November 2014, we've been working with Bailey Seafood Restaurant regarding some improvements they've done to the property. Frankly, at this point, we're still not quite sure the extent of those and whether those present any issues. Um, but they do need to be sorted through and, and uh, at the very least receive planning board review and approval. Uh, this time last year, the council granted them a renewal of the liquor license subject to settling these sorts of matters. Here we are a year later in the same situation. We are aware that they've engaged professionals uh, to assist them to navigate the process. And I think there have been some extenuating circumstances uh, with the family over the course of this time. 
So uh, perhaps Dan could provide some more detail, and we have got a recommendation for your consideration tonight. <coughs> uh, thanks, Dan Bacon, uh, Planning Director, and, and Tom did a good job of summarizing the situation. Uh, there was an installation at the Bailey Seafood Restaurant um, of a concrete pad and some sewer lines, electrical lines without permitting. Um, so they were put on notice that we needed to understand uh, the project and, and have permits and potentially board review occur. And so that was quite some time ago. That was in 2014. Um, and so your last approval said within a year, a year ago, um, correct the, the deficiencies and get permitting in place. And they haven't been able to do that. So uh, we're here again sort of at the same time. Um, where they're seeking their liquor license renewal. So we suggest that um, the council consider potentially a shorter time frame to, to see that um, they work with our department to get the proper board and then um, you know, in-house permitting in order um, so that they hopefully can utilize this space. I think that their intention is to have some outdoor seating and some outdoor facilities. So it's you know, coming up on their their summer season when they do their business. So it would be good to, to understand what that is and, and get board review and potentially in time for, you know, their July, August, September busy season. So, um, you know, if it's a, a late June deadline or, or something different, that would be a recommendation for your consideration as to make sure they get in compliance and then can continue on with their business. To that end, we have included in this order uh, given them till June 30th to satisfy the needs of the planning department. Questions for town planner? Councilor Bavon. So, um, by the way, I frequent this restaurant a lot. It's a very nice place. Um, so I don't want to be <laughs> considered biased about this. Why is this tied to the liquor license renewal rather than the food handler's license, which is the restaurant piece or even the business license for the the, you know the seafood retail business that they have. Why is it attached to this? Because don't we get don't they get approved every year too? Right, that doesn't come until uh, June. So this is. Oh, okay. Yeah. More so time. So that's why the June thirtieth is yeah. really okay. Yeah. That answers. Thanks. Other questions of Dan Bacon. Councilor Kazo. Uh, based on the conversations you've had with them so far, do you feel like June thirtieth is enough time to comply with the request? Um, we've only recently had conversations. We, unfortunately, they hadn't reached out to us for quite some time, and I think there have been some, you know, health issues and some other things going on with um, the business owners. So it's only within the last few weeks that we heard from their engineer, who wants to um, be re-engaged uh, and work for them to to execute the permitting. So I think they they have time, but they need to move forward because of it. Uh, it, the site is actually a business in a residential zone, so it's a non-conforming use, and that's why there's likely two boards that have to look at it. The zoning board would likely have to look at it because it's expanding their business activity in a non-conforming location. So they likely need to go to the zoning board, and they likely need to update their site plan approval for the planning board. So it's a two-step process. I think they can do it by late June, but they need to to move forward um, with application in the next, you know, three to four weeks. Councilor Katerina. Um, frankly, I have concerns that it's taken this long for them to um, do what they're supposed to be doing because I know other businesses in town, you know, do what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so I, I will, I will reluctantly go along with this, but I want to make sure someone is on top of this. Mm -hmm because it's not fair to those businesses who do try to do the right thing. And that's just where I'm coming from with this. Yep. Other questions for Councillor St. Clair? Oh, it's not really a question, but um, I have to agree with Councillor Katerina. I think uh, we've given them, as a, I, I remember the situation last year, and this has been going on long enough, and um, it is not fair to other businesses that spend the money and do the work and get it done. And I think it's going to be up to this council and to the other boards that we hold them <coughs> extremely accountable for that deadline. And I would hope that we're going to follow through with that. And if they don't hit that deadline, then that's it. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Uh, public comment on this matter? I'll read the uh, motion uh, uh, again before uh, asking for it to be moved. 
move approval on the renewal request for a liquor license from Stanley Bailey, DBA Bailey's Seafood Restaurant, located at 165 Pine Point Road, with the condition that he comply with the notice of violation and order of corrective actions by, the, by June 30, 2016. So yep. moved. Second. Discussion? Council like Kazem. Uh, yeah. Again, I, I, I mean, I think if the action's warranted, I just want to make sure we're not setting a business up for failure. If he's, if he's working in good faith and has been extenuating circumstances, uh, I want to make sure we give them every opportunity to comply and, and make sure that corrective action is taken. I just, if we're comfortable with June 30th, that's okay if there's enough time to get it done. Uh, if July 30th makes more sense, uh, you know, maybe that's uh, something to consider as well. I just want to make sure that we, we don't take punitive, uh, pu too much punitive action initially and give them every opportunity to make these corrections and recommendations. And I don't know if 30 days is going to really make that much of a difference one way or the other. I think the, the fact that uh, uh, there are extenuating circumstances, but I think in respect to the applicant, that uh, that's the extent to which uh, Dan Bacon indicated uh, what was going on and the town manager indicated, uh, probably appropriate under the circumstances, and, and I think probably relying upon their good judgment as to whether enough time is being afforded under these circumstances. Council Rowan. So would there be an opportunity if there were progress for a uh, another application for renewal on June 30th, should that should they be working in good faith? Mm. Um, yeah, I believe so. May I, yes, uh, their license would only be good through until June 30th, yeah. unless they met all the requirements, and then the state would be issued. Right, but if they ran out of time for a for a we can take further yeah, action. We can take at the second meeting in June. Uh, but I agree that uh, providing some motivation to move, uh, given the 2014 genesis of this, is probably appropriate. Exactly. Other comments? Uh, we move this? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, all business. Order uh, number 16-18, second reading on the bond order for the 2016 Municipal and School Capital Improvement Projects and the refunding of certain general obligation bonds of the Town of Scarborough. Uh, I'll ask the Town Manager to introduce this matter. Yep. It's been before us before. And this is second reading. Mm -hmm. This bond order uh, has pretty much two equal parts of it. Uh, the first half uh, is uh, bonding for uh, capital projects that have previously been approved, uh, some dating back as far as 2009-2010, just now getting to point of completion, uh, and others very recent, just approved in the current budget year. Uh, that totals about $3.83 million, uh, all of those projects combined, and then there's another uh, $3.8 million of advanced refunding. There's a present, projected to be a present value savings of that refunding of $285,000 over the term of those bonds. Uh, really due to uh, more attractive interest rates at this point. So we, uh, we certainly do recommend that you approve this and we'll be, actually we have rating calls scheduled with the different rating agencies later this month and we'll be looking to go to sale um, immediately thereafter. Public comment. Uh, do you have a motion? Full approval. Second. Discussion. Also Rowan. So I think as I said in the, in the, or I alluded to in the first reading, that I just have a, um, in my head, uh, re relating to personal finance, indebtedness is something to avoid, especially with operational costs. So I haven't quite gotten around to, um, again, in my head, to reconciling how it would be different on a municipal level. <coughs> uh, but that said, this is, uh, I think, fun, you know, the plan that, we've, that this body put in place to borrow this money for these expenses, and so I will certainly support it. And I, I think, as has been pointed, I think uh, our finance committee chair has pointed out before, that we make a careful judgment as to which items get uh, bonded and which ones uh, receive shorter financing and which ones become part of an appropriation in the operating budget. And I think that's uh, part of our finance committee's charge to make sure that those are appropriately presented to us. Thank you. 
Council and I just wanted to clarify, speaking specifically to, toward mm -hmm. expenses that seem more operational, we're doing them every year. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's something that we would we would move toward putting into the you know appropriation on the budget. Other comments? Councilor Gaza? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the certainly the finance committee met with the bond uh, uh, manager, I guess, if you will, or bond issue or something. I, I found that, uh, that interaction very, very helpful. Uh, I think this is in line with standard policy. I think it's good bonding policy. We're well within the limits of the town. Um, we're well within our self-prescribed limits as well as any limits that would have impact our bond rating or anything like that. So uh, I don't see any reason to, to hold this up. Other comments? None. All in favor? Uh, this is a roll call vote. Thank you. Roll call. Councilor Baybine? Yes. Councilor Rowan? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Chiazzo? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor St. Clair? Yes. Chairman Donovan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Order number 16-22, act on the request to approve the names that were posted to the Senior Advisory Board and the Scarborough Housing Alliance by the Appointments Committee at the March 16, 2016 Town Council meeting. Uh, can we identify those? I do not have that list. I was not here. I was out on medical leave for that. Oh, yeah. do you want me to, I have it if you want me to yeah. read it, but I did not. I um, participate in that meeting. I, it's in the materials, so. No, I have it in front of me. I'm just saying oh, I didn't participate. If you, if so you I wasn't sure if you. No, but if you would. Thank oh, you. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to read the order again, if you don't mind, Chairman Donovan. Yeah. Uh, order number 16-022, move approval and act on the request to approve the names that were posted to the Senior Advisory Board and the Scarborough Housing Alliance by the Appointments Committee at the March 16, 2016 Town Council meeting. Senior Advisory Board. Donna Marie Collins, first alternate with a term to expire in 2017. Kenneth N. Simmons, second alternate with a term to expire in 2017. Scarborough Housing Alliance, Marge D. Santis? Is that way off? DeSantis. DeSantis. Sorry, I'm, I apologize. Um, full voting member with a term to expire in 2017. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion? Thank you. So moved. Second. Uh, uh, public comment. Anyone wish to comment on the uh, uh, nominations? Seeing none. Uh, discussion. Councillor St. Clair. Um, I think it's always uh, we're always happy when we get these applications. Um, I think the good thing, the thing that we've been blessed with, actually, I, a lot this year is qualified candidates. And um, that's one, been one of our issues is that sometimes we actually have too many qualified candidates for some of these positions, which I don't, I'm not sure we've ever run into. Um, so that, that in itself is a good thing. It shows that we're kind of getting out there a little bit more and, and, and getting these positions out there, which is wonderful. Um, we still do have some openings. Those are posted. I can send those to anybody. And um, Todi also always has um, an updated copy of that, and we usually meet every month. Um, and if there ever is a board that has an issue and they don't have enough um, members for quorum, then we will meet outside of that to make sure that that happens. So we try to make sure that those are always covered. So I want to just thank the community and the members on that group that are also very flexible with their time when we need to do that. Um, it's great to see. Uh, some of the community members that we haven't seen in the past coming forward and, and joining these boards and really seeing what goes on behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. Appointments Committee has been busy meeting practically every, every meeting uh, in advance, met again tonight uh, to keep current. Uh, and we'll, Councillor St. Clair is the chair of the Appointments Committee and can report and Councillor comments on the posting of uh, any names that came out of that meeting. Councillor St. Clair. I'm Katarina. I'm sorry, Katarina. That's <laughs> Katarina. Thank, you. thank you. That's okay. <laughs> um, I just want to thank uh, the folks who have volunteered, because this is volunteering uh, to be on these committees. I know some of the committees are quite a bit of uh, time. Um, so I want to thank citizens for stepping forward and uh, saying ditto to the comments that uh, Councillor St. Clair. Thank you. Other comments? Comments? 
Okay, so, so I too am on appointments and uh, I just wanted to echo Councillor St. Clair's comments of the quality of people that we're getting coming forward is, is, is very impressive and uh, I want to thank the people for volunteering and serving and it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of people to serve the community and do it well and uh, these certainly are unpaid positions, the volunteer positions and I appreciate them stepping forward. Further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Hmm. New business, order number 16-23, first reading and schedule a planning board public hearing for an amendment to the town of Scarborough official zoning map to rezone the parcel located at 11 Willowdale Road and identified as map U39, lot 41, as shown on the town assessor's map from the general business district, a B3 district, to the residential 4 district, R4 district. And I would ask the town manager and our SEDCO director to introduce the matter. Slight technical difficulties. Technology is great when it works. I'll let Kara do it. I'll get the, I'll get the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening. My name is Karen Martin. I'm the director of the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, and I'm here to talk to you about um, a proposal to change uh, the zoning map um, and to change the property located at 11 Willowdale Road from uh, B3 to R4. And I'm usually not here talking to you about changing residential to commercial, uh, but this happens to be a property owner that I've been working with uh, for the past year. Um, he does have a, a single family house that's on the lot. It's been used as a um, small office, uh, but he has been having trouble finding tenants and over the past year, you know, we've really been working hard to um, try to address some of those issues. And what he did is he came to us and said, you know, I'd really like to um, look at building some housing on that lot. And because he's in the B3 zone, um, you're not allowed to do residential in that zone um, in, for duplexes, and that's really what he's um, interested in doing. And so this lot happens to be uh, the border from R4 to B3. So the property next to him is residential. The property on the other side of him happens to be residential as well. Um, however, that is also in B3. So we went to the uh, Long Range Planning Committee with the proposal. Um, there was general uh, um, uh, agreement that it's reasonable um, to bring residential to this particular lot. It happens to be um, you know, a need for the community to have some uh, rental units, and at this point that's what Mr. Russo is planning. Um, so again, we're looking at changing his lot from B3 commercial to R4 residential. Um, again, it's a fairly small lot, about uh, 1.67 acres, um, and it made a lot of sense. We've talked to some of the property owners around there. Um, we did try to see if anybody else would like to, you know, have that zone change as well. But right now, uh, people are very happy where they are. So again, we're talking about making this uh, a map change at this point. Um, and we've talked to the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, we they did ask us to go out and talk to the other property owners. We've done that, and we came back to the Long Range Planning Committee with a recommendation that we stick just with this one zone change. Um, and again, it's the change of the map. There's no change to the district itself. And the housing is what, Karen? There's, ha there's housing um, on, there's a single family house next to him, mm. and then he's planning on doing some uh, duplexes, probably two duplexes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment? Yeah. None? Uh, accept the motion. Move approval. Second. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Councillor Katerina is on the Long Range Planning Committee and yes. has been involved in this project. As the liaison to the uh, Long Range Planning Committee, we have had uh, vigorous discussions um, and we did direct um, Ms. Martin, as she noted, to go and speak to the neighbors about this. It is in what I would consider to be a transitional zoning area because you do have businesses right along Route 1 and then you go back up the street and you get more residential. Given the need for uh, rental housing in particular in this area, it's, 
if any of you have paid any attention in the newspapers at all, or if you know anyone who's trying to find some place to live that's affordable, that they can rent, uh, the more housing stock we can put into rental units, the better, in my personal opinion and in my professional opinion as a, real, as a realtor, um, would be really good. And the long range, uh, excuse me, can we talk the long range planning committee, you know, agreed with that concept. So I would fully support this and encourage my fellow counselors to do so. Councilor St. Clair. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, when I first was reading uh, about it, I wasn't that excited about it. Um, but I do, uh, after listening to your presentation and also from Jean Marie, because um, I know how heavily involved she is in the Long Range Planning Committee, um, then I don't see a reason why not to support this. Thank you. Councilor Kaysa? So two questions. Um, you noted that uh, property owners on lot 17 and 42, you have not heard back from them. How long ago were they given notice? Um, it's been about a week and a half or so. This okay. came up fairly quickly. So we did talk, uh, oh, let me talk to, um, in terms of lot 19, lot 19 I, I reached out to and we, we had a long conversation. They do want to continue to be in B3 and because he, they want to be in B3, Lot 17 really has to stay in B3 as well, so we couldn't do that change. So are we required to give notice to surrounding lots as well and give them the opportunity to comment before we change the zone? We will through the planning board process. There's a notification process that happens then. I reached out ahead of this because we wanted to know whether or not there was interest by some of the other uh, property owners if they did want to participate in a zone change as well. I guess my question is if we authorize this zone change, mm -hmm. uh, the planning board will still have the ultimate decision on whether it mm. will change or not, correct? Well, the planning they review, board they'll review, they'll hold a public hearing where mm -hmm. everybody will be notified, and then it comes back to the council. So the planning board will make a recommendation right. to us upon right. a public hearing which will give the neighboring property owners another opportunity to voice any mm -hmm. issues. I understand that. I just want to be clear that everybody understands that and we're not rushing right. into this in a week and right. a half or two right. weeks and changing something. Mm -hmm. so. Right. And it, uh, we exercised a lot of caution. We tried to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a compelling reason to make that change. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we, we decided not to do that and that's what we talked with the Long Range Planning Committee about as well. Other comments? Councillor Katerina. Uh, I know from my own experience selling property on uh, Millbrook. Um, Millbrook went through a similar process where the first couple of lots going in were rezoned. I believe it was B3, I'm trying to remember now. And there's a physical therapy place went in there and there's a single family across the street. And mm -hmm. that sort of blend mm -hmm. of housing seems to work well. And that lot 17 has 60 feet is is an odd lot, we'll it put it that way. And to be honest with you, if I were their broker, I'd be like, well, geez, your best value is to keep it in B3, but that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. other, other discussion? Good. Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order number 16-24, <coughs> first reading and schedule a public hearing. Uh, on the proposed fiscal year 2017 municipal and school budget. Uh, we will ask our town manager to make the presentation and we will have public comment following the presentation. Thank you and uh, good evening. Um, this will not be my presentation alone. This will be the second year that Superintendent Entwistle and I will collaborate on the presentation. We think it's a real uh, integral part of kind of the process that we've adopted and I think uh, it's really uh, reap benefits certainly at the staff level and I suspect many of you who've been involved in the joint finance committee efforts uh, would agree that that collaboration has been, been very productive and helpful. Um, so I will start, we'll transition to George in the middle and then I'll end. So. Here we go. First, um, as the council is well aware, the council 
sat down as a body in mid-December. Um, during my tenure in Scarborough, it was the first and the earliest time um, a new council convened itself, uh, did a bunch of kind of uh, goal setting and soul searching and group building and all those sorts of things. Uh, and interestingly, what came out of that process was two primary goals. Uh, first of which is one we'll cover tonight, and the other one had uh, had to deal with communication. That's a far cry different than processes of the past, where there have been sometimes eight and twelve and fourteen different goals that have come out. This council <coughs> has decided to really focus and do a couple things very well, this being uh, chief among them, I think. And what came out of that process was a little different approach. Because there were only two basic goals, they spent a lot more time thinking about how we're actually going to accomplish them. And so I thought it was worth really just reminding ourselves, because this, this was a touchstone for us and my, my staff in developing the budget, um, what, that, what those goals really uh, were and how they resonate. So the, the outcomes expected through this process were, were hopefully to pass the budget on the first vote. We, many of us lived through and endured a very long process, the community did as a whole, and I don't think anyone would like to repeat that again. So that, that certainly is an expected and hopeful outcome. Uh, we'd like to have and think about incremental improvement in our service delivery, and I think that's across all municipal services and schools as well. Be responsible and realistic in our budgeting and uh, in the results. Have sustainable tax rate increases. Develop metrics for budget performance. This is a piece that's been kicked around, and we need to really start to, to focus in on this piece, and I'm confident we will. Uh, Favorable community uh, comparisons to other communities, some benchmarking, some <coughs> peer analysis. Uh, the school is, is a bit ahead of us in that regard, uh, but that's another area where I think we can make some advancement this year. And the final one was uh, possibly eliminate the need to, for the school budget to go to a vote. Uh, voters will decide that it will be a matter on the ballot in June, uh, but it did come up in the council's conversation. And then they developed a series of actions about uh, really to, to demonstrate how we're going to achieve those outcomes. Uh, I mentioned earlier developing benchmarking metrics so we can actually measure success. Um, strive for tax rate at or below 3% or around 3%. I think there was some squishiness around that piece. But um, the, the message was very clear to me that that, that was a, a target that we need to be mindful of throughout. Focus on trends and more dashboarding and metrics, again, kind of performance measurement pieces. Com uh, present combined revenues as opposed to separating out town and school. We certainly have all those details, but you'll see tonight that we've, we've certainly adopted that. Um, provide accurate uh, uh, valuation estimates. This has been a constant challenge. Staff is always reticent to be too aggressive at this early stage and at the end of the day it's the tax assessor, it's no one in this room that decides that it is what it is. Uh, yet it's a very important part of the conversation um, for the council over the next several months in the community. And then certainly continue the budget form. I think universally everyone saw that as a vast uh, system improvement last year and certainly we're going to continue that this year. The, the budget approach and format, uh, a couple things I think worth noting, we've continued and in fact expanded the school-town collaboration. Starting um, late summer, fall, there was, uh, the groups got back together, kind of debriefed on what, what happened. Uh, and then in the new year, starting in mid-January, the Joint Finance Committees had been meeting twice monthly. And I think they might take a little hiatus. They had some scheduled time together through the formal budget review. Uh, but I suspect those conversations will continue. And so I've, it's been unprecedented in my tenure here, the level of that kind of uh, collaboration, and I, that's to be applauded. Public involvement, uh, we're striving to increase that uh, as we can. All of these joint meetings are public, you know, open to the public. Public comment is afforded. I think the budget form falls into that. We're enhancing our communication and have created a budget portal. So there's one-stop shopping for members of the public and in interested parties can find what they're looking for in one place. I think that was a fair criticism in years past, that it was difficult to find uh, information on the budget. Uh, from a format point of view, uh, we've, we've made some advancements. Last year, the town moved to a new narrative style. Uh, the line item detail is still there, should you wish to look at it. And I'm very pleased my colleagues on the school side uh, made that move this year as well. And uh, I know the superintendent will speak to that a bit uh, when he gets up. But we've really migrated over so that the entire budget is now uh, has an important story to tell uh, and I think it, it's, uh, it's, it's a good read. 
I may be biased in that opinion, but um, <laughs> all of this is really to encourage more macro level discussion as opposed to focusing on the line item detail and the pencils and paper clips. Uh, it's really to have the, a broader conversation and I've, I've been part of those already and I hope those continue and, and flourish. Um, this process also attempts to identify cost drivers and activity indicators. Again, these are kind of the metrics so we can start to really understand what are the things that are making this budget work or not for that matter. And then of course, uh, this is the piece that I mentioned that we, we need to make some more progress on but identifying those performance measures is an important part of this process. A couple of trends that I just wanted to, to note. Uh, from my view, the local economy is really strong. I mean, as evidenced by our continual, consistent, strong growth in valuation year to year, uh, we're really bucking the trend statewide. Um, there are some others in Greater Portland that have seen similar gains, but uh, no one as much as us, as far as I'm aware. And that has that's good and bad in some respects, and, and we'll mention that. But it's certainly an important feature, um, and we should all feel good about that. We've also seen continued um, excise tax growth. I think this is a bit of a thing of uh, a flash in the pan, if you will. I can't imagine that that will be sustained with the kind of advancement year over year. And in fact, the budget projections that I propose are, are level with the current year. Um, but that's a very encouraging feature that uh, I think, in my opinion, that's a very good barometer of kind of consumer confidence that people are out there buying cars. Um, another budget trend um, is, is certainly the continued decline of state aid education. This year, this budget um, reflects an, uh, more than a million dollar loss in GPA and a uh, similar amount last year. Uh, the only good news out of this is that we are inching closer. In fact, uh, it's in view, I think, uh, where we reach the minimal receiver status. And it's, some might say it's a cynical way of looking at it, but it's the reality. Um, the value of that is as soon as we can kind of bottom out, uh, we remove a huge piece of volatility year to year. And so uh, there's been conversations, uh, and I hope they continue, about understanding that, planning for that. And some of the implications of these budget trends um, really have to do with potential shop property tax sh or shifts to the property tax, estate aid, uh, goes away for education and, and other state aid, which is made up of a market basket of other kinds of taxes, sales, income, and, and other. Um, as they're pushed down to the local level, we're, we're, we're really bound to the property tax predominantly. And so I think I call it the new normal. I think that is in sight, and we need to be thinking about and managing a way, kind of a soft landing. And I think it's within reach. It's within a couple of budget cycles, potentially. And there'll be ongoing conversation around how we use our reserves and, and there's some remaining project funds that uh, we'll be proposing to put into use to help, at least in this year, manage that transition. So here we go in the numbers. Quick look on the gross budget. Um, just very big picture. Uh, education budget is about 54% of the total spending, whereas municipal is 37, county three, and then the capital is six. <coughs> going to move through quickly on these. The net budget, this of course considers the non-property tax revenue. Um, uh, the school share goes up just because they are so heavily weighted toward and relying on the property tax, whereas the town has a number of other non-property tax so sources. So our net budget need is uh, falls down to 29%. On the gross appropriation <coughs> side, uh, again, big picture, uh, we're looking at the town budget going up 3.57%, about 3.6%. School budget just over 5% and county just over 3%. So all in about a 4.4% increase in gross spending. This is a quick little graph. Um, the county at the bottom there doesn't uh, display very well just because the values are so much less. Um, I can assure you their curve is actually steeper than ours if you were mm -hmm. to put it to scale. But this shows no surprise. Uh, you know, we continue both on the town and the school side uh, to show that, that you know we're spending more year over year. To drill down a little further on the municipal side, we've broken it up into big kind of spending divisions, if you will. So the general government uh, division, that encapsulates a lot of smaller departments, if you will. We're showing a 2.9% increase in general government. 
public services, which would include community services, libraries, SEDCO, again, kind of a laundry list of things, of 4.7 percent. Public safety is police and fire, that's up 7.5 percent. And I'll get into some of the, the, the drivers that are driving these numbers. Public works, uh, a very modest point, you know, half of 1 percent increase. Uh, and debt is actually slightly down. So all told from the town side, that's a 3.6 percent, as I mentioned at the previous slide. Some of the drivers uh, on the town side, uh, of course, we have wage increases, both contractual and non-union. Health insurance, at this point, we have it pegged at a 5 percent increase. Uh, we think that's pretty accurate given history and, and experience. Uh, a big cost that's shown in that public uh, public safety line I just showed you in the previous slide is we now see in this in this next budget the full annual cost of the two new firefighter positions that were added in. Uh, we have two great candidates that started last week. They started at April 1st, and uh, so now we're 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 showing the full cost of those uh, those uh, personnel. We also have a very innovative program this year. Uh, one of <coughs> like Shaw's brain ch brain children's. Um, we're doing it, uh, we're proposing to do vehicle maintenance services for both uh, Westbrook and Old Orchard Beach. We have some unique expertise in vehicle maintenance. Um, so we, uh, part of this is to hire an additional person, all of which is covered by reimbursable costs. Um, we think it's a, a, it's been a successful model and I'm, I'm really proud of Mike for advancing it and also helping out our neighbors. I think that's part of the solution is that we need to help each other. Um, there's also some unfortunate loss of grant funding. The COPS grant funding, which we've used pretty aggressively through the years, uh, this is federal money through the Department of Justice to help hire new police officers. That money diminishes uh, over a four-year period. Uh, <coughs> the current year is the final year of that, so we're, we're now bearing the full brunt of those costs locally. And the EMPG grant is one that uh, Mike Thurl at the fire station has been successful in in getting through the years, and I think we'll get it back uh, the subsequent year, but uh, this next year it's a, it's a loss uh, of revenue. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we have a revenue offset for those vehicle maintenance services, so we actually make a little money, not that we're looking to, but we certainly cover our costs and then a little more. And then there's some fairly significant fuel savings. Uh, Mike and I have been able to negotiate some very favorable contracts, so we have got uh, six months of, uh, we're locked in for the foreseeable future, but we've got six months of considerable savings. And those savings accrue across all, of course, all the departments as well. What's not funded here, uh, this is an approach that I've done in the past. Uh, there's a number of uh, staff positions that I would love to engage the Finance <coughs> Committee and the full council in. Uh, there's a total of four firefighter positions and two police officers. Uh, each of those requests are well documented through um, well-developed staffing plans and both chiefs, chiefs would be very pleased to sit down and, and help you understand those requests. Uh, those shouldn't be a surprise. They've been fairly consistent for, for several years now and we've had to um, defer um, that staffing plan almost every year, it seems to me. Um, I've also got a position of title of assistant town manager, but I really want to emphasize it's really finance focused. It's uh, procurement, the purchasing aspects, um, perhaps not a full-time purchasing agent, but certainly taking on a, a fair amount of that responsibility in a budget analyst position. So it's really finance focused. To the extent there's additional time, it would be great to uh, have special projects and uh, support committees and those some general administrative work. So for that reason, I gave it that title, but it's really a finance focused position. And then a final position, we're calling a sustainability coordinator. This is a bit of a jack of all trades. Uh, they would deal with a lot of the things, um, not unlike what you heard in the workshop earlier. Um, all of these positions and requests are uh, fully developed in the exhibit section of your budget, tab nine, uh, exhibit two. And I encourage you to at least spend the time to review uh, each of those requests. And I hope the Finance Committee will allow us some opportunity to have conversation around that as well. So with that, I'm going to transition to my colleague, Dr. Entwistle. Good evening. Good evening. Um, the uh, section of this book is uh, for the schools is Section 8, 
And since we have so much real estate in it this year, um, I, ca I carry it basically wherever I go. So. <laughs> uh, like Tom, the, uh, the leadership council and, and the uh, school board uh, basically set out the main goal of developing a credible student-centered budget. <clears throat> what is a student-centered budget? It's the one that uh, addresses and is responsive to the needs of our students. Pretty simple. Um, we create a budget uh, that really allows our team to continue the targeted improvement work that we have started. Uh, we started five years ago and have continued. Um, I guess I would say to you that um, I've used this terminology before. Uh, this is not a pie in the sky budget. Um, there has never been a pie in the sky budget that I presented. Um, this is not even a student needs-based budget. Uh, this is a mission-critical budget, and it really represents the resources that are essential to or mission-critical to um, achieving the goals that we have up there, first being uh, preparation of all students for success in college, career, and civic engagement, citizenship, and the second being achieving organizational high performance and that includes both student outcomes and organizational efficiencies. And as Tom said, um, we have had some work uh, done. We've worked with the University of Maine, University of Southern Maine, um, and we've asked for uh, some analysis that's been presented to the finance, uh, Joint Finance Committee. Um, I just received the final report at 11.10 last night, uh, so that's in the process of being shared as well. I believe Joint Finance Committee members have received it and um, the board will be receiving their copy and I'm going to be reviewing that with them tomorrow night. Um, I think uh, important to the taxpayer, uh, basically, um, who is our investor, uh, this budget really allows us to make good on the commitments and the investments that we've made earlier. Um, those were important investments and um, it's critical to ensure that we continue to uh, realize value from those earlier investments. So I'm going to go through the uh, budget components. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is on page 8 of my executive summary in section 8, uh, if you're uh, trying to find anything. Um, the level services essentially represents uh, the increase in costs that are required to open the doors for the new school year next year and, and provide exactly what we're providing today. So it's not the addition of anything, it's basically sustaining what we have. Um, you can see that it includes salaries, wages, and benefits. Um, just a reminder that that makes up 75% of the operating budget for the school. Uh, it includes instructional materials, resources, and equipment, and that now includes um, those things that are electronically accessible um, in terms of education, subscriptions, and licenses, and so on. Uh, energy and utilities, pretty much the same as it is with the town. Operations, um, maintenance, transportation, technology, business and productivity services is essentially all of the peripheral services, the business services that support our, um, our uh, primary uh, business of, of educating students. So these level services, um, uh, the level services are basically uh, projected to increase uh, by 2.8%, as you can see there. Uh, the second thing that we're looking at here is the Education Improvement Plan. Um, this is found um, in great detail on pages 12 through 17 um, in the school's budget document, um, and it details exactly how the uh, 900, five, uh, 590,000 is intended to be invested um, across the district. Uh, the largest proportion of which you'll see is targeted for bringing our Scarborough High School curriculum and program of studies, uh, what I would say, uh, fully into the 21st century um, with some essential faculty resources that are needed uh, to do just that. Uh, the total investment of $590,000 um, as uh, the education improvement plan uh, uh, details would represent 1.29% of the full budget proposal 
uh, that we've pulled um, together and have presented in this first reading. This is the educational improvement plan, what it looks like. Um, again, there is a summary on page 17. It's the same as what I'm looking at on, on this slide. Um, and it adds up to that total of $590,000. It's distributed as indicated here. As you can see, um, the high school uh, takes the lion's share um, and the others really have either no gain, actually may, maybe even making a contribution like our primary schools are in terms of uh, contribution of resources back into the, uh, the mainstream of the budget. Um, otherwise, small uh, incremental investments in all of the areas with the exception of the high school. Uh, an important investment that's supported by both the Leadership Council and the Board uh, is uh, the addition of one day to the teacher's work year. And this day would be dedicated and utilized as professional learning time that would be done in an effort to attempt to protect student instructional time from any further erosion uh, because there's so much that we're expecting of teachers, there's so much learning that's essential for them and uh, the way that we've been able to do it um, as, of, as of now has been to carve into some of that instructional time. I think I'm, I'm touching the, the mouse here because I'm not used to this computer. Um, so staying on this, uh, on this one uh, chart, uh, basically the investment of um, the additional learning day you can uh, see is $123,000 and that's spread across all of the schools based on uh, the size um, in proportion to the faculty size. Um, that addition of the day would also be subject to the teacher bargaining contract. Um, added and restored in this mission critical investment, you see here um, the totals, the full-time FTE means full-time equivalent. It's basically a full-time position. Added or restored would be 6.5 in total. And even with these positions added, there would still be roughly eight fewer positions in FY 2017 than there were back in um, FY 2009. So we are not by any means um, uh, uh, hitting the lottery on positions. It's a restoration process. And I don't think that we're looking for a one-to-one -one, uh, restoration necessarily or one-to-one -one gain uh, because the needs have changed, but those 6.5 positions are uh, what we consider to be mission critical. Uh, it's easy. It's an ABC uh, 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 components to the school budget. Uh, part C is debt service. Uh, debt service is the amount budgeted in each fiscal year to make principal and interest payments on capital finance, financing that's been approved in prior years. So this is, this is essentially a calculation that we get um, for us each year in terms of where we are in terms of uh, debt service. As the town manager explained a little bit earlier, uh, there's a bit of um, offset uh, in FY 2017. Uh, from some uh, Wentworth uh, project funds. Uh, that uh, project is now closed. It's been audited, um, and we show those in the uh, revenues that you'll see on the next slide. Here we see the impact of the entire mission critical budget proposal. Um, and the offset of non-tax revenues um, is now added to the bottom of the columns that you're, I mean, or the, the rows that you're seeing. Um, that essentially includes state subsidy, as Tom says, the ever decreasing state subsidy, but it is in there. Uh, miscellaneous fees, reimbursement, and uh, uh, some of those project funds that I just referenced. Those project funds, incidentally, can only be used to reduce the project debt, but it does go to uh, reduce the demand for tax dollars. So the tax, um, and one of the other things as well, for those of you who are really quick with numbers, you may notice um, a tiny discrepancy on that non-tax revenue line in light blue, uh, three columns from your far right. Uh, that number is a little bit different than what the manager presents, and the reason is that uh, basically Tom includes uh, adult education revenues in his calculation, 
uh, we treat that and um, according to the way that we have to do our budgeting for the schools, uh, that's a separate budget. So our numbers are um, identical, but this one reflects um, an $83,253 difference. I think he projects it as uh, being below 4%. Um, so this uh, tax request, which is the bottom row, is uh, found uh, right there. I think it's critically important for people to understand because this is a big source of confusion. Uh, this is not the change to the tax rate that the school is driving. It's the school and the town's total requests that are used to compute that tax rate um, and the impact to the tax rate. And as Tom said, it's really the, um, uh, is it the tax assessor or who is it that does tax assessor who does all the final calculations? Uh, that's really just showing the, the impact um, in terms of the tax request. Um, and I think that Tom is going to, uh, in terms of looking at the school and the town's total impact, uh, Tom's going to look at that. So um, what I see here um, is uh, what you see is a lot of numbers and charts and so on, uh, which is uh, essentially uh, the summary part of a first reading. Uh, what I see here is good news. Um, I see uh, an excellent job that's been done delivering on the earlier established uh, target for FY 2017. Uh, my last slide, um, uh, it's important to know that things are still in motion and I think Tom alluded to that in, some of the, in terms of some of the items for the town. Um, we have four items here that are still in motion. Uh, debt service, uh, there is a May 2016 bond issue uh, that will have impact on debt service for FY 2017. That's still uh, coming. Um, as, as on the town side, uh, we have made calculations for Anthem rates. Uh, those are just now being released and clarified and we'll be recalculating what that impact is, but that's still a moving target. Um, enrollment, I've addressed the enrollment question in my introduction specifically on page five. It's a nice chart there that really shows a couple of ways of looking at enrollment. I think the safest way to look at it um, really relates to the new, the new housing starts that are happening here in town. Mm -hmm. It seems to be the most reliable way to predict enrollment and just from my anecdotal data that I collect on a fairly regular basis, I can tell you that enrollment has not only flattened out, it has increased. We are currently um, sitting in our schools our uh, 3,013 students. So we're over the 3,000 3, line, um, 3,000 number in terms of enrollment. Um, the other indicator that we get are the spikes that we're seeing, for example, in kindergarten enrollment. Uh, we just had kindergarten enrollment, great place to go and visit. If you want a couple of smiles, um, uh, you can check my Facebook page. There's a couple of uh, shots that I got over there, um, but there were a lot of them. There were a lot of kids. Uh, so the uh, K enrollment uh, is definitely spiking um, and uh, as well. Uh, we have the moving uh, items that, that are always with us relate to um, uh, uh, our special education needs and those are pretty much always changing and they can change week to week or month to month. Um, again, just anecdotally, I was told by the principal of Wentworth School that since September, every single classroom in Wentworth has had no less than one new student join the classroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last item in motion are the other insurance premiums, dental, workers' comp, property, casualty, and so on. Uh, those are uh, being sorted out, and, we're, and as we get more accurate information, um, we'll be making those adjustments. Um, I do hope that you enjoy the new narrative form. Uh, we put a lot of effort into it. Um, I think that I agree with the manager. It reads well. I, I think um, it is very readable and understandable, and I think uh, the good news is that it gives anyone who wants to take the time to uh, give it a read, um, it will help them really understand uh, the needs of the schools and the needs of our students. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Annette Whistle. Just a, a personal word on the, the school's job on their narrative. Um, it's my job to understand as, as best I can what, well, it's, it's 
challenge often on the school side. Um, I've appreciated through the years that a bunch of pieces existed. I've never seen them all together, and that's, for me, one of the most important things is, and I hope you have the same takeaway, is that you, you see how it's all integrated together, and it, it really starts to come into focus. So bear with me. I just want to do a quick little run through on revenues. That's a, obviously an important part of the budget. Uh, this, char this chart really just demonstrates uh, our utter reliance. 70% of, uh, of our costs, we rely on property taxes for that source, and that's, that's the pinch point for sure. Um, at this point, we're just over 4% for uh, support from the state for education, and as is mentioned, that continues to go down. Uh, the education revenues is, uh, I'll say, artificially up this year. As was mentioned, we have some additional uh, remaining project funds from the Wetworth project that shows itself in that slice of the pie, if you will. Um, but that's just a quick look at where our revenues come from. And this is just another look, a uh, little more detailed on the non-tax revenues. So um, putting property tax aside, <coughs> this is how it comes. And essentially, um, the town is responsible for about half of those non-property tax revenues. Again, we have the ability through uh, user fees with community services, or permits, all sorts of uh, means that the school doesn't necessarily have available to them. Keep moving through here. So here's a broad look at the uh, non-property tax revenues. It shows the municipal side going up 2.17%. Uh, and as uh, the superintendent alluded to, my calculation here, see if I can get fancy, does include, as the footnote <laughs> notes, um, adult ed, so that number's slightly different and it does produce a percentage just slightly below 4%. So uh, all combined, we're looking at an increase in non-property tax revenues of 2.77%. A couple of the big drivers here, as was mentioned, general purpose aid is down over a million bucks. Um, I have fuel costs down. Uh, it's both a revenue um, in our budget and an expense, so it's, mm. it's a bit awkward in that res respect, but I report it because it's a big number and it reflects in, in the, the revenue numbers. As I mentioned earlier, we have those grant funds that uh, we're losing. Um, the remaining Wentworth funds, that, that number there represents kind of clearing out that account. Bond Council's been very clear that we must use it for authorized purposes only, which is Wentworth debt. And so we're paying the entirety of next year's pay principal payment and a bit more toward interest, really just to exhaust those funds to make sure we comply with I, all IRS regulations. Child care program continues to outperform. We bring in more revenue and have fairly consistently, so we're increasing the revenue estimate for child care. That's a community services program. As I mentioned earlier, our local economy looks good. Uh, building permits and the, and the like uh, continue to trend up. And I mentioned Mike's uh, initiative on vehicle maintenance. That, that represents the reimbursement that we would get from the other communities for those services rendered. And the state has done some changes to the Homestead Exemption Program. Uh, this year it's moving from 10000 to 15000 So uh, homeowners need do nothing so long as you're already registered for the program. That will happen automatically. So that higher exemption will actually produce a, lot, a larger reimbursement uh, to the town, and, and that's why I reported here. I believe the following year it moves to 20,000 mm -hmm. homestead exemption and caps at that point. Uh, another very important part of this budget proposal is the capital improvement plan. I've just dedicated one slide, but I suspect the finance committee will spend a fair amount of time. Uh, the budget book reports them out in terms of municipal, cap uh, municipal projects and municipal equipment. I've simply listed the totals here and highlighted a couple of um, important ones. Uh, there's a recommendation from the Senior Advisory Committee to do some senior-focused uh, recreation improvements in, in municipal campus here. Uh, we've got a great opportunity to close the gap of the Eastern Trail, and uh, we're asking for some local matching funds to match state and federal monies. Uh, great leveraging uh, opportunity for us. Um, and as has been mentioned in the past, we, we must com comply with uh, federal regulations and replace our fuel station. <coughs> That's a, a very um, important yet costly endeavor for us. Mm -hmm. And on the equipment side, the typical plow truck, backhoe, I mentioned fire re the rescue and the tractor, those are purchased using reserve accounts. So just because they're um, shown in capital, don't assume that one, it's all tax dollars, because uh, in some cases when we have dedicated reserves, they are used for those purposes. 
And two, don't assume that they're all bonded. Just because something exists in capital doesn't mean it's necessarily financed at all many, on many occasions. And we've tried uh, more aggressively than ever to appropriate monies in the capital budget as opposed to bonding. And I'm pleased to get into that detail when, with the Finance Committee. And on the school side, uh, they've got a bunch of different things, but they generally fall in three categories, technology investments, facilities and maintenance, and transportation. I don't think you'll see any surprises there, fairly um, regular things. So the drum roll, please, what this all <laughs> means. Um, so the total net budget, uh, town and school combined, uh, is uh, $60,397,479. Uh, translating to a 4.1% uh, increase over current year. Um, given some of our assumptions in terms of future value, that would require a 51 cent increase in the tax rate and put it right at $16 per thousand, or representing a 3.27% increase. Uh, I mentioned that because uh, if you recall the first slide, the Council's general goal is to be mindful of that 3%. Um, history is very, very clear that um, as we go through the budget, our numbers get more refined and they typically go down. Not always, but typically in the, in the big picture. And despite the fact that I've been more aggressive here in our valuation estimates, uh, the 10 year average of growth year over year is 42 million, and I'm assuming 30 million at this point. So uh, I'm very confident that given the starting point, uh, the town council will find itself well within, comfortably within its stated goal. Uh, this is uh, a lot of. A lot of numbers, but I think it's an important chart in that it, it shows three really important variables. Our valuation growth over the last 10 years, what our commitment is, which is mean the amount we need to raise by property tax. Uh, not surprisingly, both those show a very steady path, uh, and there's some graphs in the budget book you can look at. Um, but most importantly, the final column, this is the, the annual change in the total tax rate. And I think it's important to note that uh, over the 10 years reported here, there's only two occasions where we've been, or perhaps three occasions where we've been wildly over that 3%. So uh, that's not a, an unreasonable target given our historical performance. I think it's within reach and, and I'm confident we'll get there. And this just graphically shows that uh, the line is that 3% target. Uh, more times than not, over 10 years, we've been below it. So quickly, by wrap-up, uh, the process is, obviously tonight is the presentation. Uh, the review process will start in earnest next week. Uh, actually, it starts uh, Friday this week. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the 8th, Friday, there will be a budget workshop. The school department's hosting, uh, is it noon to 4? And I believe invitations have been uh, sent to the members of council as well. You're certainly encouraged to come. It will be here in these chambers. Uh, and then next week, uh, the Town Finance Committee will start its uh, weekly meetings to review the budget request. And though I've programmed in kind of a <coughs> routine of all departments spending uh, some amount of time before the Finance Committee, I'd like to suggest, and, and I've had some conversations with uh, Chairman Baybine, that uh, there may be better use for the Council's time, that you may want to focus more intently on certain departments. Uh, I would certainly love to have your attention to talk about the staffing um, requests as well. So um, I put my staff on notice and I, I ask uh, for you to be creative and flexible and let's use your time <coughs> as wisely as possible. We have uh, four meetings scheduled and we can certainly do more if you need. Uh, but I think given our starting point, we should be very comfortable uh, working through this cover to cover. And particularly if you take the time to read the document, um, I think there's a lot there that you can get um, get a head start on. So the schedule, uh, again, tonight is uh, not only presentation, but first reading is considered on your agenda. On the 27th of this month, we do have the budget forum. Uh, it'll be very similar in format to what was held last year. Starting tomorrow, we'll have an opportunity on the budget portal to re start to receive questions mm -hmm. from the public. And uh, we do that um, really so we can make sure that we have good substantive answers for you at the, here at the forum and make sure that we will answer them publicly at the forum. So it's not as if we get one tomorrow and uh, the public doesn't hear the answer, just the, the sender does. So we'll make a point of um, recycling those and, and answering them in the public forum. Uh, the public hearing is scheduled for May 4th. 
and there'll be a joint budget workshop between the Board of Education and the Town Council on May 11th, all of which is leading up to second and final reading on the 18th of May. And finally, uh, the June primary on, at, excuse me? It will be at the high school. It will be in conjunction with the primary. Yes, the okay. The town. school budget validation vote on June 14, will, that date was chosen. It is the date of the June primary, and that election will be held at the high school. So I apologize. My reference here at the bottom of the slide is incorrect. Um, we expect uh, there will be a, a sizable turnout uh, for that event. So in a nutshell, that, uh, that is our presentation for this evening. I'd be remiss not to certainly acknowledge all the work on the part of my staff, and I appreciate my school colleagues, um, all of which really puts you at, a, I think, an advantage, a, a, a starting point that's further down the road. Um, hopefully you're not hearing things for the first time. Uh, do take the time to review the document, and, and I would be certainly remiss if I didn't recognize Colette Matheson, who's my executive assistant, who, who works tirelessly this time of year. And, uh, and Karen Martin's been very helpful in putting this presentation together as well. Uh, both the total municipal budget, the entire budget book, and this presentation will be available on the budget portal sometime midday tomorrow. So be patient. Uh, it'll take us a little time in the morning, but we'll get it up as soon as we can. And Karen put on her creative hat and put together a simple little budget brief. And in a single sheet, this gives you just a quick little primer on what we just covered for the last 40 minutes or so. Um, we'll also make this available on the website. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Uh, uh, I did want to, before we have public comment, <coughs> uh, I did want to thank the school board for uh, uh, coming and uh, being present while this presentation was made by Dr. Entwistle. Very much appreciate that. Uh, I also wanted to <coughs> thank the finance directors, Ruth Porter and Kate Bolton. Uh, the amount of work that goes into this is phenomenal. Uh, the, uh, I've begun looking at the school's uh, a presentation and it's a really an excellent, very in-depth uh, explanation of why they want what they want. Uh, so that uh, that was very much appreciated. Uh, this is really first impression for uh, uh, the town council. We, as was described by the town manager, have a very extensive process over the next month. Uh, meetings week after week. The public's opportunity to input is really extensive. The forum, uh, the public hearing uh, at each of these readings, first reading and second reading, which are held on separate dates, uh, the public is uh, a welcome. Uh, we're going to try to make this material as available as possible, and it's in a format that uh, we've made an effort uh, as our goal for communicating better uh, with the public to uh, uh, make it as understandable as possible. Uh, so with that, I think we'll uh, uh, request uh, public comment, and uh, then when the board has the opportunity, they can ask the town manager for, or Dr. Ennett Whistle for any questions they might ask. So public comment. <coughs> Please identify yourself and your address. Uh, and thank you. That's a cool back there. <laughs> Mike Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane. Uh, first of all, this is the first year that I've been to this type of a meeting and actually understood it. So my personal thanks to uh, the manager and the superintendent because after three years of following this kind of thing, I finally figured out just exactly what level services mean. So, you know, that's a good start. Uh, it could be part of my ignorance, but uh, I just never knew what that meant. I always was in a fog there. Uh, the presentations were both clear and they go to show exactly what I have said several years in a row now. We have two very highly intelligent, competent men doing the budgets. 
and I thank you for the presentation. I thought it was excellent. I hear a lot of talk about uh, mission critical and mission essential. My only input to that is there are a lot of people in Scarborough whose mission critical and mission essential definition is the ability to survive in place in their home. And I have been either in contact with people, they have called me on the phone, emailed me or stopped me in person and there's 22 of them over the last three years that are selling their homes for fear that the tax rate is going to just overwhelm them and they're going to be in their 70s or 80s and they're not going to be able to stay and they'll have no place to go. So this is a good start but when you start getting down to the the voting, I would like you to keep that in mind that there's 22 of them so far that have departed because they just can't hack it anymore. I'd like to know, will the public be able to speak at the different workshops that the school board and the town are going to have? I'll be there. You can tell me then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Others who would like to address the uh, budget presentation? Hi, my name is Stacy Newman. I live at 17 Windsor Pines Drive. Um, I want to say thank you for the excellent and thorough and careful presentation. I can tell that the town and the schools have taken to heart uh, the long process last <laughs> we had last year and really trying to stop it in its tracks. This seems like an excellent, thorough budget. I'm pleased to see that the school is incrementally putting back in some positions that we've lost. Um, I'm pleased to see that we're going for more than level services um, and that we're doing it in a very thoughtful manner. So I think this is an excellent budget. I know as a taxpayer um, and a parent that I would absolutely support this budget and encourage all my uh, fellow citizens to do the same. So thank you. Hope everyone noticed that uh, Ms. Newman had a Red Sox uh, sweatshirt <laughs> on. Uh, just a matter of importance to me, perhaps. Apology. <laughs> uh, other comments? Close the public hearing. Uh, uh, what's your pleasure regarding a motion? Move approval. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, who would like to commence? Councilor Sinclair. Um, I have to say that uh, I don't think there's anybody that's sitting on this council that was here four years ago when we had my first exposure to um, what happens when there's a first reading and a vote on something that can be contentious or critical in town. Um, and from that moment on, I, I promised myself I would never ever vote for anything um, during first reading that I didn't feel strongly that I'd had enough exposure to and read enough about and knew enough about. Um, I think I can take that back tonight a little bit, step back from that. I think both presentations were on spot. Um, I feel like this is the first time that we're all hearing each other. Both sides of the table are hearing each other. I feel like there's a different level of respect for both sides when it comes to the budget, um, I think that goes speaks highly to um, both finance committees and, and both leaders of, of both groups. Um, I hope that there's going to be a little bit more wiggle room, but I would hate to see either side lose any more money at this point. Um, I have some personal opinions. I, this is the first year that I've actually seen um, on both sides um, for myself because I did some investigating um, more than normal. Um, a lack, there's a lack out there um, of services on both sides. Um, and that's frustrating and scary. Um, and so I think this is a 
amazing start, and um, I'm actually really proud of the work that has been done. So thank you. Thank you. Comment, Councilor Gaza. So um, I like to think I'm in a somewhat unique position on the council of having exposed myself to the uh, school budget process the last three years, and certainly the town budget this year. Um, I, I really cannot stress enough to the council how important and how monumental this process has become and is right now. If you look at the, consider, consider the facts that we've lost a million dollars in state revenue, um, we've been able to address that, deal with that, we've collaboratively and collectively sat down at the table together and come up with a very respectable and reasonable budget that literally so far at step one has fulfilled four of the seven obligations that we set out to do. That's huge. That's really, really important for this town and for the community, for the, for the municipal side, the school side. Those barriers are coming down. We're starting to be one town, one budget, and one approach. And I think um, that process really needs to continue. Um, it's been, um, I think, very, very rewarding. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed at the work that the, the school board has done and the, and the staff has done to get us to where we are considering what we started out with, uh, what we're facing collectively as a town, and, mm -hmm. and, and where we're at right here. Um, certainly in the four years, we've never been at this point in a starting the process where we're as close to our goals and we're not at opposite ends trying to find a, a, a race to the middle or a race to the bottom. Um, so I would certainly encourage councillors to um, dig into this document. I, I've started a little bit, as you can see. Um, but, you know, let, let's not get bogged down into, the, into, the, into the, the too many of the nuances and the details of it. There's going to be issues and line items, I think, that the Finance mm -hmm. Committee is going to be able to address. Um, and certainly I'd be interested in comments from fellow councillors of areas of concern once they've read through and digested the documents. But quite frankly, from the macro level, which is where we've kind of all agreed to look at, I, 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 kudos to the staff. I mean, this is the, the fact that we've gotten here is really impressive, really impressive. So. Um, I, I'm certainly encouraged by the work that's been done so far. Um, I, I think we're on the right track as a town. I think we're on the right track as the governing bodies, and uh, I'm really looking forward to a, a successful first-round budget this year. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. So I think it, for our first reading, I, I think this is terrific, and I really wanted to thank the, um, the staff on both sides of for uh, putting this together. I, I echo the... Um, kudos um, <coughs> toward, you know, really trying to address the, the goals that the council set um, toward the uh, tax increase, toward the presentation of the, um, the expenses on, you know, the budget uh, with the gross numbers and, and accounting for revenue together and really presenting the fact that we are all in this together and that we're trying to address our needs. Um, and I think as a, um, you know, toward hitting that 3% squishy target, I think spot on for, for a first reading. I do think that, that I'm looking forward to the discussions ahead about the, some of the details that, that we'll get into, but um, uh, again, thank you very much. Councilor so, Gatorino. Um, for those of you who know me very well at all, I tend to be a big picture person. <laughs> so the first thing I went to was, what's the bottom line? What's the number? What, what's the tax impact look like? And when I saw the 3.27, I went, whoa. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by that, having sat through uh, a couple other budget sessions where it was like, are you kidding me? Um, so I, again, I also uh, <coughs> give everyone uh, kudos for the hard work that's gone in s so far. Um, I think this document, I had a chance to dig into it a bit today. I thought it's extremely easy to read and to follow, uh, particularly uh, on the school side, because the school side I know school budgets are odd budgets for most people to, to understand and read and did a great job with this. Um, and I encourage everyone to, you know, look at this, think through it. It's, this is the beginning, the beginning of the process, but I was pleasantly surprised by the initial number uh, and hope that um, we can move forward to help res the schools restore some of the uh, uh, programming that they've had cut back in the last few years. So 
That's where I am. Thank you. Councilor Baybine. Thank you. Um, first, uh, I get it. I've always appreciated, I mean, I'm a finance guy, so I have always appreciated the budget and how it's been presented, but I know, I think I know sometimes what I'm looking at. I get a, a really just kudos to staff. This is an absolutely wonderful document. It tells the story very clearly. Every one of the budgets, every one of the departments, including the school department, not only provides us with a narrative of that story, but also the indices and activities that each of the departments look at when they prepare their budget and why we need what we need. Um, so, you know, thank you to, especially to Kate and Colette, because I know that they're the ones that are really in Ruth in her department, because they're the ones that really are putting that, those numbers together for us so that we can understand that. Um, just a, a couple of things I wanted to throw out there. First, I'm glad that you were able, and this is kind of more of a rhetorical joke, glad you looked at gas pricing, although I'm disappointed we weren't able to cover the gap of a million dollars as one of our state representatives said that we could do, <laughs> but I had to throw it out there and thank you for looking at gas pricing. Um, I also wanted to comment, because I also serve on the county budget um, advisory committee or county finance committee for the county commissioners, and Tom is absolutely correct. The 10-year change in the county budget mm -hmm. is 48%. Yeah. The five-year change is 25. Yeah. And even though it's a significantly lower number of only $833,000, um, it is something that is constantly being attacked as much <coughs> as the municipalities are because of the state budget. And next year, they're already looking at a $1.4 million gap because of the supplemental budget not being passed by the state legislature. Um, so they're constantly being challenged. Um, I also wanted to mention that, um, sorry, I had all these members. I um, wanted to thank both of the finance committees. It's been a great process. This is our second year um, in which we did a joint process. Um, so thank you to Jody Shea, who's my counterpart on the school, as well as the other members. You know, transition and uh, work in progress takes time. Um, and um, this is the second year of a very good process that I think that we're adding to it. And this is the result, I think, of that. Um, and uh, you know, what, is, what do they say? Three years makes a trend. So um, we do have some more work to do, but um, this took a significant jump forward, I think, um, in helping us in that process. I um, also wanted to mention the question was asked about speaking at workshops and town council finance committees. I can't speak to the workshops because that's managed by both of our chairs, whether it's uh, <coughs> our chairman, um, Mr. Donovan, or Ch uh, Chairwoman Beely. Um, they control the flow of whether that happens. But I will say that at our finance committee meeting, uh, we do have a public session for that, it generally is at the end of the discussion. Um, that way we can present what we have and then have the comments so that we will always have that. We had it last year as well. I think uh, last year we had a total of five people attend 13 meetings, um, but it, it will always be open and always available. And then last, I did want to mention that um, I think the best slide that was up there, um, to keep this in perspective, is that for the last three years, the tax rate, and I'm going backwards, or starting three years ago, was 2.23%, then it was 2.58%, and then last year, um, this year we're asking for 3.27. 2.23, 2.58 is not an astronomical amount. And even if we're starting at 3.27, last year we started at 2.99 and it went down to 2.58 because of the changes that happened. This budget could be well below 2.8% by the time that everything else balances out if there are no other changes. So I'm very happy where we're starting. Um, <clears throat> to some point, a little too happy in the sense that I've always said that I think that we're in an economic cycle that we should be looking at greater investment, not taking a conservative approach because there's going to be times in the future when we enter into a recessionary period where we need to scale back and do zero to 2%. Um, so I hope that we keep that in mind as we look at this budget and what opportunities we have as well as look at the policy implications um, especially around um, the fund balance. If you look at the implications of the fund balance, it's pretty significant in this budget. Thank so thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Hayes. I just wanted oh. to... Go ahead. Peter hasn't spoken yet, but... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I just... It <laughs> just when, uh, you have a thought. Listening to Sean reminded me that I noticed as we were sitting here then on my Facebook, because I get Facebook here. But anyway... Um, the Town of Scarborough page does have a, a place for input for questions for that budget form that's coming up. So I just wanted the public to know that. So it's on the Facebook page, and I believe it's also <coughs> popped up on the on the website. 
So if you do have questions about the budget, please do that. Sorry, Peter. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, no, and I think not to beat the same horse over, but again, I kind of echo <coughs> the other. This is only my second year in this process. What a remarkable change. So just kudos to everybody. Thanks for doing it. What I'm more excited about, too, is really, it's really kind of a different tone, setting a different stage, because the, the other part of the conversation we've talked about trying to figure out is even starting to look forward and strategically plan. As we know, if we do get to the minimum receivership, what does that mean? But this gives us a great foundation to start saying, you know, we've done the capital improvement, you know, project for the, for the town. We're, we're looking at, you know, $48 million investment in infrastructure going forward. There's going to be some of that for the school. We're looking for those numbers. But this gives us a great venue to sit down and start looking forward to get to that thought planning. So that's, that's what I'm also really excited about, just a different tone, a different ability to, to plan and look at. So thanks, everybody. Uh, I must say that the budget in many respects is uh, a, an encouraging starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, uh, there is hard work ahead because we are looking down the road two, three, four years. <coughs> uh, we are heading towards minimum receiver status. The property values in the town, the assessed value of the community continues to go up. That's a terrific development, but it also causes the formula by which state aid is allocated to cause our numbers to go down. And we do expect over the next several years to reach a point where we are what's called minimum receivers. Uh, and so we need to start the planning now to be able to have a soft landing, a gentle impact, and not have uh, a precipitous increase in taxes three or four years from now. That will be the task of the two finance committees as they look at that and the recommendations that are made. Uh, it's uh, uh, looking down the road. It's a daunting task, but one which I think we're fortunate enough to have uh, started the process with this budget. Uh, uh, the school budget is far and away the best explanation of why it is appropriate to fund the school at the levels that they're requesting. Uh, I've always felt that if the school could fully explain what it was doing, uh, the community would rally around this because there's very little that we can disagree with about great schools because it helps the tax base, it helps property values, it educates our community to create good citizens. It's probably the most important thing we can do as a community. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the uh, superintendent search committee, uh, got to meet several of the principals. Um, uh, one of the principals of the Wentworth School, uh, Kelly Crosby, uh, gave me a tour of that facility and raved about the educational opportunities that that facility has created. Uh, and so I want people to realize that uh, the communication effort that we're all undertaking here is to tell the town exactly why there's value in uh, the tax monies that are being raised. <clears throat> so uh, with that, uh, I think we're ready to vote on first reading. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> Order 16-25, uh, act on the request. This is a bit of a come down. <laughs> <laughs> from the Vacation Land Dog Club, Inc., and your <laughs> County Kennel Club for a mass gathering permit for the AKC sanctioned dog show, the Southern Maine Coastal Classic, located at uh, Wasamke, Was Wasamke? Spring, Spring. Uh, Camp Springs Campground, scheduled for Thursday, May 19, 2016, through Sunday, May 22, 2016. Uh, the town clerk has reported to us that all appropriate departments have reviewed uh, and approved this matter. Uh, public comment. Anyone uh, would like to comment on this? Seeing none, I'll ask the pleasure of the board. 
So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. Yes, <laughs> Councillor Caterino. Um, Wasonkey Springs is up in North Scarborough, not too far from my house, and I know this is, I don't know how many years they've been doing this, but it's been a number of years, uh, and it's actually kind of cool, <laughs> some of the things they have the dogs do, and I know it brings a lot of business Good. up to North Scarborough to the eating <coughs> thing places, and it, I, so I'm thrilled to see this coming back again. Thank you. Other comment? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Order number 16-26, act to authorize the town manager to enter into an interlocal agreement with Cape Elizabeth for shared harbor master services. I'll ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, this is a great example. I, I alluded to another example uh, involving vehicle maintenance, but this is really the future. It's collaborating with, among municipalities. Yeah. Cape Elizabeth approached um, Scarborough uh, to see if we could assist them with some of their harbor master duties. It's a statutory position and, mm -hmm. and requirements. Uh, they have fairly modest needs in that regard. We hired a, a, a great young fellow, Ian Anderson, to be our marine, marine resource officer and harbor master, and very quickly worked out an arrangement whereby he will provide those harbor master services to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it will be reimbursed a total of $5,500 every year just to cover uh, the few occasions where he provides that service, and that's what this agreement does. It just simply uh, recognizes that relationship. Uh, and it does have an annual escalator built into it, so uh, <coughs> we need not look back at it unless the duties change. Thank you. Public comment. Anyone wishing to address this, approach the podium. Seeing none, uh, pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Councilor Gaza. Uh, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, anytime we can have shared services, I think it benefits the whole community. And I know there's, um, in fact, just this this uh, this morning, I received a call from someone in the Cape Elizabeth, I believe it was their energy committee or something, um, looking for uh, some additional information on what we're doing and how we're doing it. So um, I, it's 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 always encouraging to hear communities around us asking us for guidance. So because mm -hmm. we do realize that we do do some things very well, we do quite a few things very well actually. Um, so I do think this is the model for the future, and I think um, you know more of a regional approach um, on multiple areas is certainly well uh, well worth the effort for sure. Councilor Hayes, you got in. I, I concur. Um, but Tom, just to, if I can direct a question at the town manager. Um, I was just looking at the number of 5,500. I mean, if, if we're using 130 to 155 hours plus the use of our, our boat, um, that just seems, I mean, it seems like a lot of value for Cape Elizabeth, but I wonder if it really covers our fully loaded costs for providing <coughs> that service. I mean, it's a bargain, it seems like, for Cape Elizabeth. Undoubtedly it is. Uh, I, I'm confident it covers our costs. There's some lost productivity to be providing those services to us. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I need to be able to justify what, what we're charging. And, and this is a, um, it, it can't be reciprocal. I, mm -hmm. I want to stay, mm -hmm. treat them as a, a good partner, and I expect they'll reciprocate in the future. So I'm supremely confident we're covering our costs and a little bit more. Could we have driven a harder bargain? Perhaps. Um, but I, I appreciate your point and the, the sentiment of it. Councillor St. Clair. Yeah, I have to agree with Councillor Hayes. The first time I heard the number, I was a little bit nervous about it. It just seemed a little bit low, but um, I'm confident in the fact that both Tom and um, Ian know what they're doing and how they're budgeting it, and um, I think we just have to go with that. I think um, the one thing that I love about this is shared services is something we've been talking about for years and years. I mean, since the first day I sat in this chair, we talked about trying to partner more with Old Orchard and Saco and South Portland. Um, so I think it's wonderful that we're working with Cape Elizabeth and I hope that that's going to maybe possibly open the door for potentially other things that we can share services with. So I, I kudos to you. It just reminds me, do recall just last year, uh, Cape Elizabeth assisted us with assessing services and yep. <coughs> uh, some savings to us as well. Yep. So yep. It, it does work both ways. Okay. Further comments? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Non-action items, none. Uh, standing special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, let's start, uh, Council Baybot. Um, I have none today. Thank you. 
the uh, Housing Alliance m uh, met. We almost had a quorum. Uh, but we <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're a new member today, by the way. Yes. Yeah. And we, uh, we, uh, but we are looking at replacing our, our officers. Um, so we're going to cycle that through. Um, so that's very exciting and, and uh, pretty confident that moving forward, we're, we're going to hit it. We're going to hit it. Um, uh, SEDCO also met. Uh, we're discussing um, the uh, STAR community's evaluation and, and uh, the part that, that SEDCO can play um, toward making that evaluation. Um, Historical Preservation uh, Implementation Committee met. Uh, we have a, a tentative date for uh, dedication of the uh, Danish Village Arch. Um, tentatively on May 18th before our town council meeting um, because we're hoping that perhaps some of the councillors will be able to attend. Mm. Uh, we're going to uh, have a very brief um, ceremony, uh, again, tentatively. Um, and we have a rain date also tentatively scheduled for Sunday, May 22nd at 3 p.m. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Caterina. Um, let's see here. Long range planning. Uh, we talked about the star communities and had a report as to what SEDCO thought about them. And uh, we're starting working on the uh, comprehensive planning, which is coming up, um, and how it's going to work, and how we're going to, how we, we will look at the whole um, portion of that. Uh, just as part of my communication duty, I told you about Facebook. Don't forget about our town of Maine, of, I can't talk, town of Scarborough, Maine Facebook page, where there are some interesting things being posted there now. I know, like for example, there's an electronics drop off. I forget the date. April 18th. April 28th. Oh, 28th. Thank you. I knew they had an eight in it. Nope. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's not? It is not. Oh, whatever. Anyway, else. go to Facebook. <laughs> You'll find it. Um, that's at the, uh, I believe it's the Scarborough Church. It is the, the Church on Blackmore Road. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, also, uh, on April 26th at 7 o'clock, Scarborough Kindness Project is doing their compassion dialogue program, so I just wanted to let people know about that. Um, our community calendar, uh, Steffi Cox and Karen Martin worked very diligently on that. Is that now online, Tom? I meant to ask. I, I forgot to ask you before. Sorry, April 16th is okay. the electronics. Thank you. April 16th for electronics. Um, the community calendar is something that if you have a, uh, something that you would like to have posted in a community calendar, you can go on the web page and post, and as long as it's appropriate, we will allow you to post it. But it is, it, we do have an administrator who looks at everything that's being posted. Um, and ordinance committee, we haven't had a reason to meet recently, which is a good thing. And that is it for me. Uh, the appointments committee briefly met this evening. Um, Kimberly Fowler, she has been appointed um, to the housing committee. Huh? So I think that is going to make you extremely <laughs> happy. I think you were jumping for joy in the meeting, which is great. Um, uh, technically, the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Um, uh, she's extremely qualified. Um, had a, again, uh, we're, we're, we've been incredibly blessed with these people that have all these experiences, and she's a she's a broker. And um, I, I think the one thing that really stuck out for me is that um, that I found is so appealing to her. And excuse my personal opinion, but um, she had written in her application that um, she feels strongly about working with people on both ends of the spectrum right. and um, really finds it, um, it gives us very happy when people who are struggling or have struggled in the past are, and she's able to find them housing and I think that's something that will be really valuable to have someone with some of that compassion and not saying that you don't have that on that already but um, it just it, the way she phrased it it really stood out to me and I, I think that's a wonderful thing so I think we're lucky you'll you'll be lucky to have her and hopefully in our uh, next meeting we'll get her voted in so Yes, that's it. That's all I have. And, and we, we post the names of committee members who are being nominated, and then we act upon those uh, with a vote at the following meeting. So, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, no formal liaison reports tonight. And Tom, can I direct another question at Tom? Tom, had you planned yeah. to talk about the Eastern Trail Alliance in, in your manager's report? No, uh, I hadn't included it, but if, if you'd like. Yeah, I was just going to give a quick update. There, there has been a group meeting around trying to do fundraising and planning the whole extension of the Eastern Trail. That, that's progressing. They've got some media 
materials now. They're actually formally trying to go out and start to solicit in-kind contributions and donations. So that's well underway and moving forward, which is pretty exciting. There's a really dedicated group that's meeting pretty frequently to discuss that. It involves a lot of town personnel too. So looking forward to see if that can come together in the next couple of months. Yeah, as soon as we have the, the final materials, we'll certainly share them with council. Um, that, that's within weeks at the most at this point. Councilor Kazem. So for Energy uh, Energy Committee, um, I believe the library is looking um, in search of a, a solar energy grant, uh, and they've reached out, I think, to community members, community mm -hmm. leaders as well, for potential um, uh, letters of encouragement or letters of support. So I know that's sitting with the, the town manager right now. Um, certainly, if uh, if appropriate and if allowable, I would encourage council members as well to, mm -hmm. to write something if that's something that they're uh, willing to do and it's something that would benefit the library but obviously we'll wait for for a uh, response from the town manager to see if that's uh, appropriate or necessary but certainly would encourage uh, participation if we're allowed to or if it's necessary um, and then uh, moving forward with the Energy Commission and again I'll, I'll refer to, to Chairman Donovan um, I wasn't there but I know we started some policy reviews as well on the Energy Commission but I'll, I'll defer to your report as I was I missed the last uh, the last meeting on the school side of things, um, I would like to extend my um, um, appreciation to the school board. They're here tonight. Um, they have been working incredibly tiresome and tirelessly, excuse me, for the past <laughs> weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Long night, too. Um, multiple, multiple things going on, superintendent searches, budget meetings, um, calendar things. I mean, these... The, I, I, I'm, I'm honestly happy I'm off the board now because the <laughs> amount of work that these guys are doing they are too. is really phenomenal. So. <laughs> they are too. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky you, Sean. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I did want to say thank you for coming out tonight. I know a lot of time away from families and a lot of hard work, so I appreciate that, and, and, and I'm glad we're, we're able to keep working together. Um, the Scarborough High School Project Graduation did a fundraiser with a hypnotist, David Hall, um, there was some concern there wasn't going to be much uh, participation. At the last minute, there was a, a very large rush on tickets. Uh, I attended. Luckily, I was not hypnotized. <laughs> to everybody's pleasure, but um, uh, it was really an enjoyable show. Um, I think uh, there were a lot of students there and a lot of parents and teachers and staff. Um, initially, I think the kids were a little apprehensive about it. Um, uh, towards the middle of the show, there was a lot more enthusiasm, and, and I, I believe they're going to try and bring it back next year. So if you didn't have a chance to go this year, <laughs> highly encourage you to go next year. It was very entertaining. Uh, great cause. It's for, for Scarborough High School Project graduation. Mm -hmm. um, they're still taking donations, so that's not the only fundraiser. You can go online. I believe on the school website, there's a link, um, I think, on the high school side. Um, still looking for donations, um, so if you, could, uh, if you could find it in your way to do that, that would be greatly appreciated. And um, I was um, reminded uh, during uh, the um, shared services comment that I was neglectful in mentioning that uh, there's a very, very successful um, shared services agreement between Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough oh, wow. on the um, nutritional program with Mr. Esposito. He's a shared uh, uh, food service manager, I guess is the, t I'm, I'm assuming that's his title, um, doing some really phenomenal things in the school with local sourcing, more back to homemade uh, scratch type baking and, and, and food preparation, removing a lot of the processed foods out of the stream and it's been incredibly successful and um, not only st uh, staff but kids are also raving about it too. So, um, <laughs> you know, that, that's yet another example of that shared service model being successful. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris could not attend the Energy Committee. He's the liaison for the Energy Committee, so I attended, uh, and I had been the liaison for the previous two years. So this is a group I'm familiar with and, and excited about the projects they're pursuing. Sometimes it doesn't sound very exciting, uh, but we're, uh, there's been some advancements in front of the PUC on uh, uh, municipalities' rights to acquire street lights, Mm. Uh, install high efficiency lighting, low electric use lighting, uh, and we're going to be uh, pursuing that project. Uh, the Energy Committee also discussed and very much expressed their appreciation at the advancement of the trash program, and I think the town manager uh, in his report can uh, speak to a number of the steps that have been immediately initiated 
in that regard. And, the, and it's nice when you put as much work as the Energy Committee did into that effort because it was a difficult one to, to really find ways to improve the condition uh, of that, that subject in town. Uh, they, they were very pleased. So uh, uh, town manager's report. Thank you. I hadn't prepared any thoughts in solid waste, but I can provide a, a, just a quick update. We have advanced, I think, all of the near-term recommendations that came from the committee, those being um, establishing three different locations, central locations for compost collection. This will be an opportunity for homeowners at no cost to them to drop off uh, compost at hopefully convenient locations, uh, those being down here at the Veterans Home, uh, Hannaford Supermarket, no, excuse me, Walmart, I beg your pardon, and Pleasant Hill Road, uh, Pine Tree Waste will have a facility there as well. Um, there was a letter uh, in the Leader newspaper, I believe, last yeah. week that publicized it. We're also advancing the stickers. This is kind of shifting gears away from compost, although compost is part of the uh, education. This is the education outreach, just to remind people what's recyclable and, and what goes in your trash and what doesn't. So these are the st stickers affixed on the top of the, uh, the, the roll-off cans that we all have at our homes and they'll be deployed uh, sometime later this spring, so we're well on our way there. Um, I think those that's are the two big issues. That's it. Uh, I just have a couple of quick um, updates, if I could. Uh, the plumbers are back in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been sighted on all three beaches. I believe in Higgins, they're starting to really um, make themselves at home, such that IF&W has actually installed stake and twine, mm -hmm. which is a pretty good indication that they're here and looking pretty comfortable. Uh, we'll be installing, if we haven't already, by the end of this week, all of the signs that we've developed and that have worked quite well. So um, we're back in full swing. I wanted to mention uh, the council at your last meeting approved an assignment of parking leases for the Higgins Beach Inn. Mm -hmm. I just want to advise that for reasons I don't know, that sale did not go through. Mm -hmm. So Higgins Beach Inn will continue to be the owner and operator. Uh, mm -hmm. No additional action by council is required. Should there be another buyer, I'll come back to you with uh, seeking further authorization. I really think it depends mm -hmm. on uh, granting consent as to who okay. that buyer is. So, uh, Also, we're advancing the gateway signage. This is a project that's been a couple years in the works, um, but these will be new signs that will appear at kind of the entrance points to town. Uh, Dan Bacon, Karen Martin, and myself are making rounds out to the social uh, the service clubs to enlist uh, their financial support for the project, though we do have nearly all the funding required through a prior capital improvement project. Um, our reception, I think, is going to be very good by these service clubs. Uh, we're going to give them some space on the sign to mm -hmm. put their logo and publicize the fact that they're, uh, they're active in town. Uh, the police department and fire department is combining and doing their annual public safety award ceremony. They do it annually at the Windsor Homer Auditorium at the high school. This year will be Friday, April 29th at 5.30. Um, I do credit these, these two organizations to take the time to do this. They recognize really extraordinary things that are done in each of those uh, departments. And if you haven't been to one, I, I encourage you. It's really a worthwhile event. And I think hopefully you've all seen that the uh, Scarborough Area Chamber has uh, sent out the invitations for the annual municipal mm -hmm. officials dinner. Mm -hmm. This year will be at Bella Vida, right up here in Oak Hill. Um, I didn't attend the opening there, but those that went to Bella Vida said the food was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps the, uh, yes, we might expect right. that at that event. <laughs> um, that will be Tuesday, May 10th, 6 to 8. They are looking for you to respond if you are going. So if for whatever reason you didn't get that invite, you can talk to Tudji or myself, and we'll make sure you do, but that's always uh, seems to be a very good event. And beyond that, uh, I'm certainly pleased to have reached uh, this point of getting the budget. Um, my work's not done by any means, but uh, it's a lot of effort getting it to this point. I'm pleased to, uh, to kind of hand it off and to be available for the finance committee and the council and the public as you take uh, the journey of the next six or eight weeks. Good. Councillor comments? Why don't we start it? Sorry, just a quick question if I could for the Certainly. town manager. And I, I apologize, maybe this was discussed in energy as well. It, it, will part of that composting be uh, having loam or something available at the transfer station, or was that not discussed as being part of that pickup? No, that's, we didn't negotiate that as okay. part. I, I think there's opportunity there. They, they have those sorts of systems in place. Yep. I, I think that's something you may do in the future. Uh, I should have mentioned as well, it wasn't part of the Energy Committee initiative, but the Conservation Commission 
simultaneously yeah, doing the backyard composting. And so the point of all of this is that there's many opportunities for the average homeowner to mm. reduce their waste stream. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate the question. Yeah, April 11th, yeah, uh, April 11th. <coughs> uh, there is a backyard composting uh, evening uh, that should be very good. Uh, we did talk about uh, the idea of composted material, uh, but it introduced a level of complexity that we weren't ready to, to really uh, uh, adopt or address at that point. Get the three locations out there, get people, the whole idea is get people so they're starting to think about composting because our best way to reduce our trash bill is to re is to reduce the amount of uh, food waste that goes into the uh, trash basket. So uh, if we can make it convenient by having common area drop-offs, doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and I think once we get this established, uh, we probably will start to talk about whether uh, free compost can be made available. Thank you, Tom. Uh, why don't we start at this end with councillor comments. <clears throat> so um, obviously first hurdle in the budget is is um, is there. Uh, we've taken it. Um, um, I, I, I do want to try and keep things into perspective. Uh, we are looking long term. We're doing the best we can to look long term. I think it's critical that we all keep that in mind and, and um, we're trying to, I think the analogy has been made a couple times, we're, we're, we know we're, we're coming in for a landing in terms of minimal receivership. We're really trying to make that a nice gentle landing so that we don't crash and, and, and burn when we hit the ground. Um, I think the process we've started is, is going to accomplish that and um, I'm, I am appreciative of everybody's hard work and effort in that process and so far uh, I think it's been very positive. Uh, everybody stayed positive um, and encouraging and collaborative and I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged that we keep it that way as well. So um, a lot of work, sorry, a lot of work ahead on the detail side of things but that's par for the course anyway. So. I think I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I'll just briefly say um, that I've been out the last eight weeks on a medical leave. I very much appreciate Tom and um, Tody and Peter for keeping me um, up to date. I think the only probably good thing about it was that I had a lot of time to read. Um, so that was actually quite beneficial in this whole process. I don't normally have that amount of time to sort of dig into things. So it's it, that, that was a good benefit for me. So um, I just want to make sure that um, I thank you for um, continuing to support that and um, uh, it was very appreciated. <coughs> thank you. Um, first, uh, Kate, welcome back. Nice to have a full council back. Glad you're here. Um, wanted to uh, kind of queue up and ask, now, especially with the summer coming at some point, if we can get an update report regarding parking at Higgins Beach and the changes that we approved this past year and how that's being fully implemented so that uh, um, as more uh, people return to Scarborough for the summer, we can understand uh, what that is and where it's going. That'll be uh, good information. Um, I actually uh, was in the process of calculating something when you asked me for a finance committee report, so I apologize for not giving one. I do want to mention the next two most important dates to remember are um, April 13th, well, I, I should say this three, which is this Friday is the school board's workshop um, around the budget. Um, it's very, very important if you want to get more finite information around where they're spending their money on their programs. Um, we're kind of charged with looking at the total allocation and not the programmatic pieces, um, but it is a good, um, good read and a good participation exercise. The other one is that um, on April 13th is the town council's first meeting. I'll be reaching out to the two finance committee members um, for our committee to talk about the schedule to, to confirm how we'd like to go forward. Um, I, I am kind of hoping that we can consolidate the five meetings um, and look really at the bigger picture and the macro um, of the entire budget um, and some policies that really affect the budget um, going forward. And then the other one is really it's the 27th of April, which is the budget forum. I cannot stress more importantly that the most important thing that we accomplish between now and the referendum is that we have full civic engagement and that we have participation by the citizens, not only at the committee level, but most importantly at the public forum. And then uh, making sure we get out the vote for June 14th. 
you know, today was a very promising start. Um, not only were all the comments positive um, and polite, um, that doesn't mean that um, we all don't share in the responsibility of approving this. And so I hope that the, um, the advocates on whatever side they were um, really do show up in June and um, show their support for this budget, um, whatever it, um, when it comes out and, and uh, comes down to the final number. The one thing I do want to mention that's really important, and, and we did cover it and Tom covered it, what people don't realize is what this could have been. <laughs> With a $1 million gap from the state, mm. the tax rate would actually be approximately 4.9% this year. That is a huge consideration that we've been able to absorb that reduction in state educational funding. And not only that we've absorbed that, but we have a plan on how we can absorb it going forward while minimizing the impact of the tax rate into the citizens of Scarborough. So I think that is, uh, you know, kudos to Tom and to our uh, financial advisor around our bonds and Ruth and the school department and as well as the boards um, for having that foresight because we are getting, that was the first exercise of looking forward to fiscal policy that isn't just in this current year. And that's a big, big step. So I just want to say thank you to everybody, to the school board and, um, and uh, to the finance committees. Looking forward to the work. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Uh, so I first wanted to say uh, to Councilor St. Clair, I'm really happy to see you up and around and, and uh, appreciate your presence back. So, um, and then I also wanted to um, thank the school board for uh, coming out tonight for all the hard work that you guys do um, and also for including uh, Chairman Donovan on the um, uh, selection committee for um, the superintendent. I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to um, just announce that uh, St. Max, Max's over on Black Point Road uh, is starting a community garden. They have some beautiful raised beds that are available if, if um, they get terrific sunlight. There's water right there if, if anyone is looking for um, a uh, garden plot. It's available and the uh, dirt has been, um, they've been filled very uh, professionally, I would say, by uh, several of us with wheelbarrows last Saturday. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I also had the opportunity to attend the um, presentation down on Pine Point regarding uh, Pine Point Road. Um, th thank you to the Transportation Committee and to uh, town staff, Mike and Angela and Dan. Um, had a great presentation. I thought it was a, a terrific discussion. Um, I think that, that uh, certainly the feedback from the community is invaluable, and I think that the, as a draft of the, the uh, concept plan, um, it looks really nice. Um, so I also was going to mention the electronics drop-off on April 16th, um, and the uh, Compassion Dialogue on uh, April 26th from 7 to 9 will be, will be here. Um, I, uh, the Kindness Project is lining up some... Um, some very interesting panelists. Um, I think it'll be a really good opportunity for um, people to come and just talk about communication and talking to each other and, and uh, certainly in light of the recent uh, vandalism in town and, mm. and some of the um, mm. less pleasant aspects, uh, I think so that, that uh, compassion is really important. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is I really enjoyed having a clock Me right too. there so that we could keep track of it. Where's the clock? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I'd love to see the clock come back. Please stay. They're both. That, that's not no, a clock. No, there's one on the side wall there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, can, yeah, I can't. I read it. I can see it. Just <laughs> like Thank you. Um, I. I'll keep my comments uh, brief. Um, basically. Welcome back, <coughs> Fred Get, and thank you to the school board also. From me, uh, I am. I'm excited to see the work that's been done towards working towards greater tax stability in this town. I know it's been really rough the past few years uh, since the economic downturn and and the downturn with support from the state and just all sorts of negative things have been happening in the town to make our taxes look like they're doing this. Um, when actually, to be honest with you, and again, this is my real estate hat I'm putting on, I get from a lot of people, geez, your tax rate's really low. And when you compare it to other towns uh, around, but our values are high, so it seems like to some people that our, our uh, taxes are, are high, and they are for some people. So working towards this minimum receiver, I think, is very important um, for the uh, tax stability portion of for Scarborough. 
and I think that the collaboration between the uh, board and the town council has been awesome this year. And this is the first time in my this is my third year going through this that I feel like there's as much collaboration and working together towards a common goal. So I'm I'm very uh, I'm pleased by that, and I am looking forward to seeing how we can make this all work. Thank you. Oh, and I wanted to apologize to the school board. I'm going to miss your thing on Friday. I'm going to be away. Otherwise, I'd be oh. there. So thank you. <laughs> really quick. Super quick. I'm so sorry. I, I, no, just one quick thing. Um, I know obviously school didn't just start, but I feel like sometimes when the weather gets a little bit better, people start driving a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I was, or this morning I was dropping my littlest one off at daycare, and I saw two people run um, a school bus red light. Ooh. Like, oh, I can just barely get in under the, you know. And the problem that I think people don't realize is little kids, right. They don't always wait for the red sign because they're excited the bus is there and they're moving and you can't see them. And right. so if you see a bus that's starting to slow down, just slow I mean, it takes two seconds. Where oh. do you have to be? That is so important. And I just hope that people, the ramifications of that could be sure. unbelievable. Yeah. So um, to see it twice in one morning um, was, was sad and you could see just the, the bus driver, the exasperation on his face was just... Mm. I felt terrible for them. So anyway, I just wanted to sort of just say qu very quickly, um, just slow down a little bit in the mornings. It's not that important to get where you're going. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll join other councilors. Uh, uh, best wishes to Councilor St. Clair. Back, up, walking, that's great. <laughs> difficult recovery. Um, busy time uh, 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 for me during the last several weeks. Uh, uh, Karen Martin and I attended a Complete Streets conference, about a half a day conference in Westbrook, uh, again on improving how our streets function. It's late, so I'll, I'll kind of limit my comments on that. Um, last week, uh, three to four hours a day for uh, the screening of the new superintendent. Uh, uh, passed along names to the um, school board. Uh, it was a particularly, I really want to thank the school board for having a town council representative. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, very insightful and gave me an opportunity to, uh, to have a very good sense of the candidates um, and also to meet a lot of very nice people. It was a 15-person uh, committee uh, and it uh, introduced a town council representative to uh, a number of people in the education community. Uh, and I think that's helpful when we can have that kind of relationship and those relationships established. Um, uh, attended the Joint Finance Committee meeting, I guess a week ago, the Muskie School at USM presented uh, a report on the school's performance and it really showed what an exemplary school system we have. Uh, very statistical in its orientation, but it uh, uh, demonstrated on a per pupil basis. We are sort of just in the middle of uh, uh, the group of schools that we would compare ourselves to and substantially below those that are the highest performing schools. And yet on our performance, our proficiency uh, ratings, uh, we were far and away the best of the uh, comparison towns and approaching the uh, the towns that have the <coughs> highest rankings in the state. So clearly moving in a in a in a, a good direction. So I thought that was uh, was very positive. Uh, attended a uh, conference on drone law. Uh, clearly an increasingly unpopular uh, activity. Uh, I wanted to be able to have a good sense if it became necessary. FAA governs this, uh, but they're also taking a very hands-off uh, approach to the whole issue of privacy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, trespass, uh, nuisance. These are all kind of, as, as a lawyer, as state law torts, uh, and they're the kind of things that fall to the local police department, generally, to be able to enforce. So I wanted to be able to understand that uh, more carefully so that in the event that we do have to take some action, uh, I'd have a good sense of, of how we could, I could help guide the town council in that respect. Um, 
The community calendar is uh, really a terrific collaboration. The vision committee, the summits that SEDCO has run, uh, uh, Karen Martin and uh, Steffi. Steffi Graff. Uh, Steffi Graff's on staff? Yes. Wow. Uh, uh, and uh, Stephanie's efforts uh, <laughs> with Project Grace uh, are tremendous. Uh, growing and uh, and uh, supporting our community uh, ever so much more, but this is really a, a, a good advancement. It's not Craigslist. Uh, it's no. intended to uh, uh, be used for municipal or nonprofit functions, right. uh, and that should be emphasized so that anyone who has a nonprofit function, you will be able to have your message. Uh, Gotten out in that in that manner. Uh, uh, I, let's see. Uh, well, not wanting to be outdone by Mrs. Newman, I hope everyone noticed that I have my <laughs> Red Sox tie, tie on tonight. My favorite tie, and uh, uh, I have Fever Pitch all lined up as I do every April to to watch it again. And so, uh, with that, with that, I'll uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. <laughs>